Hey everybody, what is up my conscious collective? It is I, once again, Rich Roll here after a brief respite, the nature of which we will soon elucidate breaking organic gluten-free bread with my main squeeze, Mr. Adam Skolnick, master of pen, scroll and word here to deposit sound waves derived from ones and zeros into your ear canal, ear canal, ear canal, <laughs> into your ear <laughs> canal. Uh, for those who are new, typically we break down matters ranging from banal to consequential. We do a wee bit of show and tell, we share a few wins of the week and we round it all out by answering some of the questions dropped on our voicemail, which you can ring up at 424-235-4626. Today, we're gonna do things a little bit differently. We're going to hone in and focus on one story, that story being that of the Iron Cowboy and his mind bending 100, not just 100, 101 mm. consecutive iron distance, iron cowboy distance, as yes. he likes to say, triathlons, which is a feat or a feat of, how do I describe this? A feat of fitness prowess to which both of us, you and I, Adam, bore witness um, we are gonna share a few wins. And then we're gonna go to my interview with Minneapolis Mayor Jacob Fry, which was recorded during the final week of the George Floyd trial. So we're not gonna do listener questions this week. Uh, but before we dive in, a quick word from the sponsors that make this fiasco possible. Sorry to interrupt the flow. We'll be right back with more awesome, but I wanna snag a moment to talk to you about the importance of nutrition. The thing is, most people I know actually already know how to eat better and aspire to incorporate more whole plants, more fruits, vegetables, seeds, beans, and legumes into their daily routine. Sadly, however, without the kitchen tools and support, very few end up sticking with it. So, because adopting a plant-based diet transformed my life so profoundly and because I want everybody to experience some version of what I've experienced, we decided to tackle and solve this very common problem. The solution we've devised, I'm proud to say, is the Plant Power Meal Planner, our affordable all-in-one digital platform that sets you up for nutrition excellence by providing access to thousands of highly customizable, super delicious and easy to prepare plant-based recipes. Everything integrates with automatic grocery delivery and you get access to our amazing team of nutrition coaches seven days a week and many other features. To learn more and to sign up, visit meals.richroll.com. And right now for a limited time, we're offering $10 off an annual membership when you use the promo code RRHealth at checkout. This is life-changing stuff, people, for just $1.70 a week, literally the price of a cup of coffee. Again, that's meals.richroll.com, promo code RRHealth for $10 off an annual membership. All right, let's get back to the show. And we're back. Adam, we have two things to celebrate today. The first of which is the fact that yesterday was your first, your very first Father's Day as a father. It was. How are you doing? I cannot deny it was a rite of passage, but um, I'm not festive, Rich. I'm not, a I'm not that guy. <laughs> I'm, not, that? I'm not here to be festive because a day, a certain day comes up and they tell you it's that day. I also resist the social contract that mandates we celebrate holidays and other people on appointed dates on the calendar. Exactly, I don't need my wife to paint an Instagram soliloquy of my greatness <laughs> on a certain day, like these other. As long as she's <laughs> doing it on other <laughs> randomly appointed days. Yeah, no, I expect it several times a week, just not on Father's Day. Right. Yeah. It's sort of like uh, the bridge and tunnel crowd. <laughs> Right, <laughs> it's, it's it? amateur day. Oh, you're like amateur night. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, um, but that was a different era. That was the exclusive exclusiveness era, exclusivist. Meaning, we're, this is we're, the inclusion we're, era now. We're both having trouble with our vocabulary we are. today and speaking. Um, but problem. no, but it was, you know, it was a rite of passage. It was the first one. I fed my child. I bought paint for his new bedroom. Mm. I swim ran. Um, but mostly I fixated on a 60, 66 year old German scientist named Julianne Diller. Tell me about her. She is the quote woman who fell to earth. Did you know about this story? Well, I didn't until it popped up in my Twitter feed and was set ablaze. It was trending on Twitter the other day, this crazy story. Incredible, like there was a New York Times story about this. Not the first time her story has been told. The headline was something like, 
the, this woman fell nearly two miles to the earth or something and yeah. survived. I like how the New York Times kind of uses artful clickbaity titles yeah. now to draw attention to stories like this. Well, cause this is really an environmental science story, but right. it does have this life and death element. I mean, she's the sole survivor of the deadliest lightning strike disaster in aviation history. It's coming up on 50 years this Christmas when she was 17 years old, she was flying to the Panguana research station in the Amazon basin of Peru. Um, the oldest Amazonian research station in Peru. Um, and so she lived there. Her parents were these zoologists that set up this station uh, from Germany. Uh, and she lived there, they lived in Lima for a while. And then when she was 14, she got moved to the middle of the jungle and she was on the flight back with her mother. And uh, all of a sudden, 20 minutes into this 50 minute flight, everything starts shaking, the, the, the uh, luggage, you know, the overhead compartments open mm -hmm. up. It's like, it's like the bad movie, you know, right. like where everything's showering the people, this has really happened. And she looks out the window and the wing gets hit by lightning. She sees it. And then uh, her mother turns to her and says, it's all over now. Like in a really steady, like how German is that to be that cool under <laughs> I know. You know, like just total zoologist. It's all over now, honey. Uh, but what happens is she's in this, bench of three seats in near the back of the plane and the plane breaks apart. And all of a sudden she, next thing you know, she's flying through the air, no plane. She says like the, the plane left me, I didn't leave the plane. And she starts, uh, you know, she's, she's just doing circles like a spinning leaf mm -hmm. towards the jungle cano canopy. And it, it looks like she described it as looking like broccoli tops. Um, and she passes out and she wakes up under that seat with a broken collarbone and, and a bad cut. Um, and a torn skirt, but nothing else. And she's got a you know, swollen eye. And then she has to hike through the jungle for 11 days with yeah. just candy. And, and she finds water, follows the water and eventually finds a logging camp 11 days later. It's um, the craziest story. I just pulled it up on yeah. the screen here. Um, 86 people on this flight, she's 17. She's sitting next to her mom. And there's that amazing quote about how she didn't feel like she got ejected from the plane. The plane just sort of left her and left everything her. sort of was quiet. Yes. And she's buckled into this seat, a three seat kind of sectional yeah. and blacks out and wakes up essentially pretty much fine, broken collarbone. But the big thing was that she lost her glasses. Right. And she's terribly right. nearsighted. Right. And then has to figure out how to, in the middle of the am. Amazon, figure out how to find civilization. Crazy. And it takes 11 days and she's 17. So 86 people, everybody dies except her. It's unbelievable. And she- How do you fall two miles? Two miles. I don't care 10, how- 10,000 feet. There, there must be something about the blacking out part though, that has where to have helped. you go limp and yeah, you don't yeah, have yeah. that, you're not rigid. I mean- it, And she must've been the, I would think that the canopy caught her and so it slowed the fall and then hit like, kind of a dense leaf, like leaf litter must be like, the loam must be like so mm -hmm. thick and and soft earth that that must've helped. I mean, she when she started to make her way, I think she laid there for a day and, until the search um, helicopter, she could, the search planes, she couldn't hear them anymore. Right. She thought they weren't gonna come for her. And then she looked or like as she walked away, she'd see some of her fellow passengers like, you know, dead in the ground. And she was searching like women's fit footwear to see if it's her mother. Her mother never painted her toenails. Yeah. I mean, she was doing that. And as she was walking, she realized I haven't done anything with my life. If I survive this, I'm gonna do some good. You know? Here's this photo of her revisiting the crash site in 1998 with Werner Herzog. Werner. Which is so awesome. It's awesome because you, know? you just talked about Werner yeah. with... with, with <laughs> <laughs> Did you hear that story that Van. Uh, that Van told about meeting Werner Herzog? I haven't gotten to that part yet. Oh, it's yeah, great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It tells a great story. Um, yeah, it's an unbelievable story, uh, this woman. And then goes on to be this legendary biologist committed to this particular part of the world. Yeah, and it's, it's become this preserve with 500 species of trees, 160 types of reptiles and amphibians, 100 types of fish, seven varieties of monkey, 380 bird species. There's hundreds of insect species. There's more bat species in their preserve than all of Europe. I mean, mm. it's, uh, it's incredible. And, and the story goes on to basically say, 
that we are at 16, 17% of the Amazon has been eradicated. And if you get to 20%, um, you get to a point of no return, she's saying as a scientist mm -hmm. and that, uh, but you know, until that point, if we can preserve more of it, we're in good shape. But we already, she says the average temperature has gone up four degrees since when she was a kid. Why is this article being written now? The 50, I think it, the peg was a 50 years ago, this Christmas is the, is you know the the um, anniversary of this crash and it's this big aviation disaster. You know, oh, I thought the crash was Christmas well, Eve. Yeah, it's Christmas Eve. I don't know why. Mm. You know, but it makes me want to read her book. Well, this is a good way to kick this off. You know, we started we started with an interesting story right out of the gate. All I said was, "Adam, how you doing?" Well, it's our one year anniversary. I want I to know. bring Speaking the, I of bring anniversaries, so we're, we're celebrating <laughs> this woman surviving this crash. Yeah. It is also the one year anniversary of us sitting together and doing this thing. I know. How do you feel about that? It's been a lot easier than those 11 days, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I feel great. Probably. I mean, it's hap I'm happy to be here. I think as we get into the Iron Cowboy stuff, I think I've, I've I've reached another level of understanding of the power of the ritual podcast mm, and well, I am it's, pleased it's, to be here. It's been a, an amazing iteration and evolution of the show. It's been an absolute joy to do this with you. Oh, thanks man. I've really enjoyed it. Uh, the audience definitely loves it. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about that in a minute when we talk about the Iron Cowboy. Uh, the funny thing is despite all the kind of heavy stuff that we cover and, and you know how intellectual we try to be about all these stories, yeah. the primary focus seems to be on this relationship that we have and the threat that Brogan Graham <laughs> poses to the that. Existential and threat. How are we working out this social <laughs> dynamic? I still get Brogan <laughs> okay. comments sometimes. I know, <laughs> it's unbelievable. I know, well, it's a powerful, it's but Brogan's a, human, a powerful the man. Human, the human mind works. So. Um, but that's good. How, is, how are you, Rich? And Enough about me. Doing okay. Uh, speaking of Father's Day, yeah, I celebrated Father's Day with my wife, six thousand miles away, in in she's in Europe right now. Uh, Mathis, <laughs> one of my daughters, was in Santa Barbara. Uh, Jaya wanted to know if Jaya could go see a friend. <laughs> so you can't complain about socially mandated holidays and how you have a resistance to them if you're not gonna. Um, reap the results of being on what it feels like to be on the receiving end of that <laughs> with like-minded individuals. When you lobby for that, so your it was whole, essentially life. no. It was nice. Look, the boys made dinner with Jaya, yeah. and uh, we watched a movie last night. But it was pretty chill. I Good. did, you know, I was supposed to be the the re, it, all of this happened because I, originally I was supposed to be in Sun Valley doing this. Eversting event, the 29029 okay. event. So everybody made separate plans because I wasn't even meant to be in town to begin with. Um, Were but, you gonna actually do the event? Yeah, I was gonna do it. I yeah. mean, I did it in Utah. It must've been two years ago, a year and a half ago at this point. Um, I was really looking forward to it, but there was with Julie being in Europe, there was too much going on with the kids. Uh, Mathis produced a pop-up event mm. for 30 vendors in Hollywood, all these How cool. high school kids who design garments and jewelry and all kinds of cool stuff. It was like a frat party for artistic Hollywood kids <laughs> <laughs> at this warehouse, um, but it was pretty cool. Like she's an entrepreneur, man. She put this whole thing together with a friend. And well, I wonder where cool she gets see. it from. So I wanted to be able to attend that. And also Jaya just started a new school. Cool. I couldn't not be here for that. Yeah. And there's some other things going on. So just, you know, it, it it was the right decision to opt out of doing what you know I like doing, which is being outdoors and doing hard things. But family first, my friend. So yeah, yeah, it was pretty uneventful. Things are opening up here in California pretty rapidly. I'm anxious to get back in the pool. Mm. I haven't gone online and checked to see what the pools in my area are doing right now, but I suspect if they're not already fully open, they're going to be soon. And I'm looking forward to that happening. Yeah. Well, that would because you've had some back issues. Does that does swimming does swimming help with that? It helps, yeah. and it doesn't aggravate it. Yeah, you know, it's it's such a gentle way of working out in yeah. terms of your joints and you know all of that. So it anyway. was it was swimming pool warm in the ocean. This I mean, at the surface, what it was the, like what's si the temp right now? It was sixty eight degrees at no Westward. Way. 
Like I was getting 68 on my watch after some dives. It was about 63 at the bottom. Mm, Maybe it like not bad at for, all, at, from 20 foot on, it was probably like 63, 62, yeah. um, 68 at the surface. Uh, so if you're just swimming, I mean, it's like, it's, it's gorgeous. I, I, I was lucky enough, April um, basically carved out some beach time for us and hooked up a nice brunch on Sunday. So mm. um, shout out to the lovely wife. Cool, man. Yeah. We well, had a good time. Let's uh let's dive into the big story let's that do we're it. gonna focus on today. The recap of the Iron Cowboy Conquer 101. Yes. Uh so as many of you guys know by now, especially if you if you follow this show or you follow me on Instagram, on June 8th, James Lawrence, aka the Iron Cowboy, achieved something I personally, honestly, did not think possible no by way. completing a hundred consecutive iron distance triathlons for people who are listening or watching who don't know what that is. It's a 2.4 mile swim followed by 112 miles on the bike, celebrated with a marathon, 26.2 <laughs> miles all in one day. He did a hundred of these in a row, mm -hmm. walking out the front door of his house, making a short jaunt down the street in his neighborhood in Linden, Utah to a local pool that he essentially rented. Beautiful Linden, entire, Utah. Yes. It's like talk about Linden. It's like Calabasas set against the Rocky Mountains. Uh, I don't know about that. No. It's a little bit different. <laughs> it's a unique place. Yes. Um, but he kind of did this all in his general area. It's a flat terrain as long as you don't go up in the mountains mm. and essentially went out his front door and did this every single day, not missing, this is the important part, did not miss a single day. No. There was no days off. No days this. off. And then he celebrated this insane accomplishment by waking up the next day after doing a hundred and doing it again. Yes. So the Conquer 100 is actually the Conquer 101. The so I wanna talk about our reflections on all of this, as well as our impressions of actually being present and bearing witness to this. Um, you went a couple times. We each were there. Yeah, it's been a while since we've done a roll on. So I showed up on day 91 and just backtracking a little bit when James did his 50 iron distance triathlons in 50 states in 50 days, I showed up on the final day and ran the final marathon with him. It was such an amazing experience. I did a podcast with him before uh, he set off on that experience. I did one afterwards. I made a vlog about being there on that final day. And um, I wasn't gonna let this experience eclipse my attention. I wasn't sure I was gonna be able to make it on the final day because Jaya's birthday was the day after that and there was a bunch of stuff going on at home. So I had this window of opportunity to show up for day 91. I wanted to jump on it in the event that I would not make it there for the final day. So I was there on day 91, I walked, it's kind of like a power walk, like he was walking these marathons for a large chunk of them. Yes. But walking doesn't really, tell the tale because he's moving pretty quickly. Like you, it's easy to fall off the back yes. if you're just walking. Like you have to- You have, you have to, to jog to catch a, up if you do. Yeah, you would have to jog to catch up. Yeah. Like he's really figured out how to move it, you know, pretty quickly while walking um, and got to spend a little bit of time with him. I mean, one of the cool things about doing a day other than the final day is that there's less people, you get some FaceTime. I surprised him. I was able to have some cool conversations with him, take his temperature on how he was feeling. Um, spent a little bit of time uh, talking to uh, his friends, his wingmen, uh, some of the people that have flown in from all over to get a, get a little piece of this for themselves, which we're gonna talk about. Um, and, you know, spent some time with his kids, Lucy in particular. And it was amazing, I loved it. Um, mm. And then, you know, I was able to figure it out to go back there for the final day. And we were both present for that experience. Yeah, man, that was, that was incredible. I mean, I'm so glad that you were there for that. I mean, um, for me, I got interested in this, but I didn't even know until it had started when you started to bring it up on roll-ons. I didn't mm -hmm. know who James was. I hadn't heard of his first record, uh, the 50, and, um, and then got interested. And so I went out there for the New York Times Sports in that capacity, um, which was the first my first on the ground field assignment since COVID, you know, mm -hmm. my first flight and my first, uh, and my first flight was delayed three and a half hours. So 
that was pretty fun. And it took you a while to get there, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But then I checked into a nice little <clears throat> hotel on the side of 15 next to a guns and ammo superstore. Yeah, there's there's no shortage of gun shops and, and shooting ranges in this it was, part of the world. It was the glamor of the road hit me right away, but it was, um, I got there just in time to get to the finish of day 98. Mm -hmm. um, I literally drove in <clears throat> 45 minutes before they finished in the park. And um, and it's in, Linden is kind of like a new build town that used to probably be kind of a hay farm area and, and where they ride is to the existing hay farms now. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of between Provo and Salt Lake, which is Salt Lake being a budding tech center now. It's like, it's it's coming, you know, it's on the come up and they're right in that corridor. And there's a lot of cyclists, a lot of athletes in that area yeah. of tr because of altitude and just, it's a nice place to live. There's a lot of sunshine. <clears throat> and so that was cool. I love Utah. I mean, Utah is one, one of the most beautiful states we have and I've always loved it. So it was fun to go there. Um, day 99, woke up at five to get to the, to the swim. And my plan was to swim with them, which I did do. And so I, but I didn't expect the pool to be so packed. Mm -hmm. Like when I had originally organized to go out there and I was talking with Lucy, I said, would I be able to swim? She said, yes, any day, but the, the last day. And I said, because the last day is already fully booked out. I thought, oh, okay, so they're keeping track of who's swimming. When I got there, the, the pool was like, five to a lane. Right. And so, but right. I got in anyway, and I did most of the, the 2.4, but it was like a Forrest Gump experience. Like he swims a hundred and he wants to swim on, he starts the next hundred on the two minutes. Right, so he does 40, he basically does 41 hundreds on the two minutes yeah. every day. And, and he would stop and take a sip. So whenever he stops though, the entire pool goes dormant. Maybe a couple <laughs> stragglers in the, That's the far the Pied Piper effect. It's total Forrest Gump. Like he stops, they stop. He goes, they go. And hold on a second yeah. though. Please tell me you didn't wear your snorkeling mask situation for this swim. Rich roll, you know me better than that. <laughs> what, do no! you what do you think I wore in that pool? <laughs> Did you not look around and notice that everybody else was likely wearing typical swimming goggles? There's only one. There's a reason for that. There's Adam. only one mask guy in every pool. <laughs> yes. They're like, who's this Who's this guy from Los Angeles yeah. from the New York Times wearing a snorkeling mask? In his camo, in his camo, uh, what's it called? The, the the swim, not Speedos, but the longer- Trunks. The little, no, oh, they were trunks. The, uh, jammers. jammers. Uh -huh. My camo jammers with my uh, my thing, but it was, you know, the sun, like the, there was still a, like a sliver of the moon over the Rockies and the sun hadn't come up yet. It was quite beautiful. And then afterwards, like someone's making great vegan pancakes on the griddle. He he eats his breakfast in well, the shower. Well, James is definitely not vegan. No, as 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 we yeah. as I learned over the course of you that sent me day. a photo of him eating a pancake in the shower. Yeah, he's yeah. he was eating his blueberry pancakes in the shower as he got ready. Um, so then then they took off on the bike and and I kind of followed them around a little bit just uh, at, at the beginning and then at the and then at the halfway point I met them. They would all descend. Mm -hmm. The cyclists would descend on this mini mart in the middle of Payson, Utah. And um, it was pretty fun to watch that. And then I followed him around the hay fields for a while. And then I did some time on the marathon like you, I, I, I walked a chunk of it that evening. Um, and that was my day 99. Um, and you know, what was cool is, was the community that kind of rallied around them and the camaraderie and all these individuals that had, um, and on day 99 and day 100, I really focused a lot on talking to some people that, mm -hmm. that had done some really amazing personal firsts, like uh, a neighbor that they have who's, he's not a really tall guy. So he was 60 pounds overweight when this thing started. And um, he started to show up. He'd never done swam a lap in his life. And he comes in and James insists he gets in the pool. He gets in the pool, starts to cobble together pieces of the swim, piece of the ride, piece of the run. Um, he loses 35 pounds by day nine and on day 98, he finishes the entire full distance, mm -hmm. um, finishing it after everyone else. And then he has still had six miles to walk. Right, is he the Hispanic guy? Yeah. I talked to him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's He's an from, incredible story. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. He's from, uh, his, his family's from Mexico, um, but he has uh, a Japanese name. I'll get it for you. I have mm -hmm. it queued up here. Um, but. He, uh, so that was one story. Um, his name was uh, Takashi Nzunza. And that's one story. Another story, Haley Ingram Jones, 
She gave birth to her first child in January. Her husband was really into this and he joined kind of the caravan, did a couple of full distance triathlons, several marathons. He was one of the, you know, the guys in the yellow shirts that were kind of keeping a bubble. Yeah. He was one of those guys. Mm -hmm. um, he, she had never ridden a road bike before. Um, she'd never swam laps in her life, uh, but she just felt, felt left out, felt bad. She felt like it's, it sounded to me, she, she, they were surprised by the pregnancy and she wasn't mm -hmm. like fully mentally prepared for her whole life to change. And I talked to her several times and, and, um, and she was just feeling, she was in that funk and she just ended up like taking two weeks to kind of feel it out, did one 33 mile ride on her dad's bike that she borrowed, um, worked out, looked at YouTube for a workable swim stroke. And then she just said, the heck with it. Two weeks later, she has the whole damn thing, full it's distance. It's so crazy. And this really is the story here. Yeah. It's about the power of community and the example that James set and the vibe of inclusivity mm. and this sense of heightened possibility where these people, I mean, that's a woman who would never even conceive or consider doing a full distance Ironman. That person's not signing up for an official Ironman. No. But seeing those, those people out there every single day, suddenly it seems like, hey, maybe I can do this. And you chip away at it. And then a week later, you're like doing the whole thing. The whole thing. It's crazy. Two brothers, 18 and 14, their mother was a triathlete. She died after a long bout with breast cancer. They heard about, that was last August. They heard about this after it had already started, maybe in May, I forget. Mm -hmm. And um, the younger brother did several marathons. Uh, the older brother did two full distance and several marathons with his brother. I mean, this is like, and it's the same thing. Yeah. Every time it's almost with minimal training. You, we met a PhD student from Mumbai who lives in Dallas that moved right. there to do He's the marathons. He's getting his PhD in like AI. Yeah. And he had promised himself that he would one day run a marathon, mm. but just couldn't get himself off the couch to get going on it and was following what James was doing on Instagram and just basically said, screw it. Flew from Dallas yep. to Utah, got a hotel room and just started showing well, up. We moved in with his buddy who lives in Draper, oh, is Utah. It, is that what it is? Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. He sort of set up shop here though. He, he did. He relocated he, essentially. Yeah, he did. So that he could come and join in the marathon, which he did a little bit here and there. This is then, Saeed Syed is his name. Yeah, Syed. Yeah. And, then he, and, and then he started just doing the whole marathon. I think he did six of them or seven mm -hmm. of them or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. um, would do his schoolwork during the day because it's all virtual. Yep. And then show up at, you know, they'd start the marathon around, you know, between like 1.30 and three every day. Yeah. And bang it out. And uh, the mother is Haley Ingram Jones and, and uh, the, the boys are the Lindberghs. Jacob and Sam, Jacob's the eldest. The point is there's unlimited stories like this. Like when I was there on day 91, I met so many people who had some version of that same story. They lost a ton of weight yep. or they changed their life yep. and they just wanted to come out, support James and also have this experience for themselves. I mean, again and again and again. Yeah, and again. I mean, the, that that's the, I think the unexpected uh, galvanizing force of this whole thing mm -hmm. was the fact that by doing a hundred in a row, he made a full distance Iron Cowboy triathlon feel doable. Yeah, like personally, someone who's done a sprint triathlon has done this, you know, the smaller swim runs and loves to get out there. I, it's been a long time since I've ridden bikes regularly, but I used to do that a lot. Um, I never thought it was doable for me. I never even considered that it would be doable for me personally to well, ever do it. It's been presented and marketed as the you know most difficult thing anybody could ever right. do, like the, the ultimate pinnacle. endurance challenge. Right. And he normalized it. He normalized in such it. A way. And and now, which like, is perhaps why the Iron Man brand is not so crazy. <laughs> maybe <laughs> not, but in a way, it's actually good for them. Like it is ultimately, it, yeah. because more people are going to say, "Oh, I could do that. I'm going to sign up for one." Well, that's the thing. I was there, and I remember telling you, I'm like, for the first time, I. I feel like I could actually do this. Mm -hmm. like, but it's weird because first of all, let's keep it real. James Lawrence is an elite athlete. This is not, we're talking well, he's about- he's off the charts. Yeah, he's off it. Like know. when he was before, so he's also a crazy competitive and gets his mind, like when before all this, when he was just like a guy attending bar and golfing in Canada, he like heard about some contests on the Ferris wheel 
in his mm-hmm. town and he had to stay on the Ferris wheel for 10 days, like from 8 a.m. to the park close at 10 p.m. And the last guy standing was gonna win for 25 grand or something mm-hmm. like that. And he does that, like he right. wins that. Yeah, he demonstrates his mental fortitude yeah. early. <laughs> early And that on. sets the stage. It's almost cinematic. Like <laughs> it's foreshadowing. <laughs> the, the Ferris wheel, the Ferris wheel to scene. Come. Yeah, he told that yeah. story the first time he came on the podcast. Yeah. It's, it's, it's wild. But that's a great story. It and, is a great story. Yeah. And, and you know, that being said, that's one of the many reasons why I mentioned earlier on the podcast, and I said this to James on day 91 when I was with him, I said, you're, you're so physically strong. Like he's not built like a runner or a triathlete, right. like he's a brick, yeah. this guy's ripped. Um, but that strength is eclipsed by his mental strength. Oh, yeah. And my fear was that because this is a guy who's just never gonna quit. Like he, there's no way this guy's gonna pull out. Like he is not gonna fall prey to some kind of mental defect no. that's gonna you know, get him to pull the rip cord. He will literally break his body before he says, stop. And I, expl- I said that to him, I go, that's you know, what I said on the podcast. That's my perspective on this. So I worry about the long-term physical implications of what you're doing. And he proceeded to tell me some pretty crazy stories about what he's, endured and weather that aren't really part of what's been shared on Instagram. Mm. Basically, we all saw him um, after, I don't know, it must've been like five or eight of these things when his ankles were all swollen up. He was having unbelievable shin pain, could barely walk. And it looked like the whole thing was gonna crater or teeter. And then he threw a friend of a friend, got hooked up with an orthopedic surgeon who knew somebody who was working on this sort of device that was a bit of a, um, what do you call it? Like a um, a brace? He said it was a carbon fiber insole mm. that with the brace secured it. So it allowed right. it some sort of cushioning. They customized for his, it yeah, though. There yeah. was a clinical application for it and they customized it to make it work for him and his particular dilemma. And he ended up wearing that for quite a long time and that allowed his shin to heal. Um, but he said, short of that, he felt like he might just snap his leg in yeah, half. He told That's me how that. much pain he yeah, was in. Yeah, yeah. And he was willing to do that. Like this is it. He will snap his leg. <laughs> he will before he quits. But his <laughs> the brace allowed that to heal. But then it created an imbalance that started to cause problems in his hip on right. the other side. Radiated to his hip, um, and then he got in a bike wreck. That right. would have taken somebody out, most people out. You know, mm-hmm. he they wouldn't even have finished, and he didn't even the miss a day. The woman riding in front of him got something caught in her spokes, I believe, okay. and toppled over. He got lucky there because that could have been a lot yeah. worse. And that's why those guys in the yellow shirts are so important. And Casey and Aaron, his wingmen, yep. they're wingman. out there protecting him, um, policing the peloton, and making sure that people get a little bit of juice from James from time to time, but also making sure that there's a little bit of a barrier to protect him. When there's so many people out there participating, they all wanna have a little bit of a moment with James, right? right. And that could be very destabilizing or, or distracting for yeah. this guy who's trying to do something very hard. So in addition to just physically, you know, barricading him. They also have to be politicians. Like they're mm-hmm. both very gregarious characters. Oh, great guys. They're, they're amazing. Aaron, and- <laughs> Aaron is a, a very gifted yeah. cyclist. Casey, yeah. I mean, obviously can, can do the riding, but Casey is uh, Casey more the, the runner. Run. And he, yep. you know, he swam three he's days a week. talking to everybody, tell me your name. Like if he saw yeah. somebody getting too close or tr- hogging, you know, yep. the time, he would have to go in there and nicely try to distract people away from him. I mean, that's a skill uh, on, in its own right. It is. And on day 99 though, he seemed relaxed. Like mm-hmm. it was, it, on day 99, it felt like, you know, he didn't, he wasn't worried about, he, you know, they, they knew they needed to make a bubble for day 100, but mm-hmm. Casey was so chill on the, on the, the marathon. I, I started calling it the marathon, not the run, because that's what it was. And it's not really a walk. Like you said, it's more like a march. Yeah. So on the marathon, he was like super relaxed on day 99. I was able to talk with him for a while. But then day 100, we're there and it, he decides and the, you know he goes, so the average speed on the bike for most of it has been, the, the pool was the same, two minutes, 100 on the two minutes, like you mm-hmm. said, 40 of those. And then the ride, he was mostly keeping it like at 19 miles per hour, kind of as the average pace. And, and uh, Aaron was monitoring his pulse rate and keep making sure it was around 120, which is crazy. I mean, like mm-hmm. at altitude and then, 
Uh, but the next day they fired up that pace to about 25 miles an hour. I think it was just under 25 miles an hour. So they were hauling. And then for the first time since day five, he was gonna run the whole marathon mm -hmm. and they go. And you know, we caught them at one point and ran with them for a little bit. I, I stopped and interviewed some people, but they were, what was the pace? Like 10 minutes, a little under? When we were running on yeah. day 100? Yeah. yeah, it wasn't fast, no. but he was running for the first time in a very right. long time. And it was a very hot day. It was very hot day. So we run and what's with- what's the altitude? Like 6,000? No, I think like it's that? just 55? under 5,000. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. And or around five, 5,500 yeah. maybe. So he was probably running yeah. 9, 30, 10 minute pace. Yeah. And so then you and I break out and we're thinking, because we're not running the whole thing with them. And we figure we want to get to the high school for the finish. Mm -hmm. And so we do that. We go to the high school for the finish. And all of a sudden I'm talking to Lucy who paused to recognize Lucy Lawrence, who- Unbelievable. While her, while her dad's doing this and she's managing the entire social media and the PR, and she's 18 and she graduated high school within that period of time, just, just before like he finished with not just her, her diploma, but with an AA degree, like the equivalent of a two years of college. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> she's amazing. She is. <laughs> and for those who enjoyed this whole experience on, on James's Instagram, yeah. that's all Lucy. Like yeah. she produced this entire virtual event. She was running social for James. Yeah. Meanwhile, coordinating relationships with sponsors and also all the merchandise stuff yep. that they were doing. We were out running and on day 91 and she's like, you gotta do a, a, a sponsored spot for this company. And she's like, here's what you need to say. And she's, <laughs> she's literally like, I was like, you're, you should go to Hollywood and produce movies. Like yes. she was so on it. She's yes. like, no, you're not doing it right. You got to do it like this. And we need this now, you know, like yes. bossing him around. Oh yeah, she's good. She. If you're a brand out there who needs somebody to run social, she is who you're looking for. Yes. Unbelievable how committed she was to this and what an incredible job and that a she talent. did. Um, and so anyway, I'm, I'm kind of like checking with her to see how he's doing. And she finally, she gets a message and we, we realize that James is actually having trouble. Mm -hmm. So from mile 19, his legs would stop working just right. all of well, a sudden. Just to back up for a second yeah. here. Um, when I, I ran the first six miles with him on that day and he had told me on day 91 that he was gonna bust a move on day 100 and lay it out. He shows up with you know the fancy running shoes. He's good to go on day 100, starts out with a jog. We're running lightly. Um, I could tell he didn't really want to interact with anybody, mm. but I did get a couple you know quick moments with him. And I said, are you still planning on dropping the hammer today? And he said at mile 20, I'm gonna drop the hammer. Like that was the plan. He was gonna lay it out. And I said, how do you feel? He says, I feel fantastic. It's like, all right, good to go. So yes, after six miles, I pulled out, you and I went to lunch. Um, then we go to the high school and we're helping them set up. There's gonna be this big to do when mm -hmm. he comes into this. That high school is enormous by yeah. the way, gigantic yes. with this huge football field and stadium. And we help set up like a finish line and all that kind of stuff. And then, sorry to interrupt, continue. No, and so then we are just kind of hanging out and then I get wind of what's happening and I'm like, I gotta get there. And so I start kind of jogging up to where they're gonna come down off that kind of uh, city bike trail. Cause they would do out and back, two different out and backs normally, but this time they were coming off that trail that they do these out and backs on. And then you call me, you, you lost track of me. And I'm like, and, and all like, of a sudden you, you cut to you and I, I running up to right. meet the marathon. Right, so Lucy sent you a little video clip. He, right. was, he was literally stumbling. Well, I was standing next to her when she first got it. And then I'm like, I gotta get there. So we went up and we get up there, maybe a mile from the finish or something. Something or, like that, and, a and, mile and, and a half. A mile and a half. And he starts, and we see, like this minute we see him, um, he has another one of those episodes. And we saw it like three or four times where his wingmen were actually catching him or he right. would have fallen on his he face. He was passing out and stumbling over his feet, yeah. like losing consciousness. Yeah. So he claims he of, wasn't, but I think he might have been. Well, yeah. you know, I, yeah. I don't know that he's the best narrator. <laughs> he's an unreliable narrator of his own experience at yeah. that moment because he was so out of it. Yeah. Um, so the idea of like dropping the hammer, because in the, in the 50 50 50, he was drilling it like mm. the last marathon. And he was finishing with like six, 630 miles for the last 10K or something like wow. that. I think he wanted to repeat that performance. It was a really hot day. One of the things we had talked about was why did he start this thing when it was literally snowing and <laughs> right. sleeting and so cold? Well, right. 
when you're built like that, you're not going to do well in heat. Like right. he he doesn't have you know the thin body composition that allows his core temperature to cool down quickly. Um, heat affects him disproportionately, I think, in part because of his bulk. And he knew that the heat was going to be a problem for him, and that's why he started it as you know in the winter months in the way that he did. And he was sort of reaping that on that final day where the heat, I think, was really catching up to him. But yet, yet he never stopped running. He didn't no. walk. He he kept running. And he would pull it together and, and start pull it running. together. And then he gets in and he does four laps around the oval. Mm-hmm. And um, you were right, right there in the first couple of those. And yeah, I, yeah. I, so I broke off and just tried to chase they him. They let down. like everybody run one lap, and then it was only friends and supporters yeah. or something like that. And I was going to pull out, but. Um, Lucy and Sonny were like, no, you should go. So I, I was able to kind of run behind the wingman and yeah. take a little bit of video of that that I shared. Um, and then, and and then, then the last lap he did by s- himself. He, but he did the last two laps, apparently, according to his watch, he did sub seven minute mm. pace. Mm-hmm. So he did get a little taste. Yeah. And this is after like almost collapsing, a, you know, half a dozen times at least. Right. Yes. Uh, unbelievable performance. I, I call that like, that's one of the great, athletic performance you'll ever see. And the yeah. crowd's roaring. There's over a thousand people. This, they thought there would be 2000. It might've been close to that by the end. It was definitely over a thousand people. finishing a little bit earlier. They were yeah. expecting about 2000 people. Yeah. I would say there's probably maybe a thousand or something yeah. like that. I'm not a very good judge. But of that whole grandstand size, was packed. And, it was crazy. Yeah, It was crazy. And, there was and it was so roaring. exhilarating, yeah. exhilarating and amazing to it see was. him conclude you know, this chapter in his life. And mm. then he gets up Moments later, yeah. and gives a speech, and he's regaling people, and you know, like he came back to life. Yeah, he did. You would have thought this guy's getting carried out on a stretcher. Yeah, he's going to the hospital. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> he goes, he gives a ten-minute speech, and then spends the next two hours give, signing autographs and taking pictures with people <laughs> on his feet. Right, I know. Unbelievable. I know. Um, but he also had told me. You know, they had told me that there's going to be a day one on one, and I was flying I was out. That you flew out. Too. He he yeah. told me that too. So yeah. that was planned. You know, he wanted to spring it on people, yeah. but obviously, you know, he already had a kit made up. So yeah. you know, he knew he was going to do that. <laughs> the merch was strong. The slip. merch game was strong. I mean, a new kit every day. <laughs> Are you kidding me? I can't imagine what their house looks like with just boxes, and I wouldn't want to be responsible for shipping all that stuff out. Great designs. The wingman. <laughs> the wingman uh, yeah. bike kit is fabulous. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Yeah. Um, yeah, so so uh, doesn't tell anybody except you know obviously his supporters and his family that he's going to do this and wakes up the next day and just blows people's minds by doing another one just with just basically went to the pool by himself yeah. and then his wingman and a couple of friends joined him for the last day to just put the 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 nail in the coffin to any doubters yeah. and to really emphasize and underscore the point that. Um, when you achieve, even when you achieve such an outlandish goal, there you can actually still do more. Yeah, I actually was able to swim with him in that morning, um, a couple of lanes over. Uh, he he they did a, he did the first section of the swim um, by himself, and then I I was able to they, they allowed me to get in there and I swam maybe fifteen hundred uh-huh. or something with him. Did he have any words for you about your? goggle equipment? <laughs> no, is you might be surprised. He was focused on the task at hand. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. He had um, something else on One his thing mind. I did I did want to ask you about though. Yes. You got a lot of love out there on the course. It's true. A lot of people were like, I know that laugh. Yes. Wait, is that Adam? Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's so, true. <laughs> in addition to this being your first field assignment yeah. since before COVID, yeah. we're here on the one year anniversary. It's really the first time that you ventured out into the world outside of Los Angeles. Yes. So you got a little bit of taste, a little taste of uh, audience love. I got some of that Rich Roll. There are a lot of podcast fans out there. I had some, some, some Rich Roll shine on me. So it was good. It I, was cool. I love that. That was the coolest thing for me, uh, having you get recognized that was for cool. doing this thing here on the mic. Was Thanks, like man. Really, really awesome. Yeah, it was cool. It was the first time that's really happened. I mean, uh, it was disorienting at times, but it, in a good way. And uh, and I, I, you know, I appreciate the audience and, this this position I'm in right now, so the right. seat, yeah, it's cool, and uh, and it was, you know, that is like the, you know, for you too. I mean, that is like the exact place you've been. You, you know, what's cool about it is you've been promoting what James has been doing from day one, yeah, and and so it's not surprising that there was such an intersection there because like part of the reason Saeed Syed was there was because you 
told him about James Lawrence. Right, because I was yeah. doing podcasts with him a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. I've kind of been talking about him forever. I still feel like media is dropping the ball in terms of giving this guy some love. Yeah. You know, I think this sort of eclipsed any kind of mainstream attention. I'm delighted that the New York Times greenlit you going out there and doing a story and I look forward to that story coming out. Yeah. But on the whole, aside from a couple like sort of local news stories, um, there hasn't been that much attention. Sports Illustrated wrote an article and was, I was really glad to see that they acknowledged what he had, what he had done. But yeah. when we were on the but they final weren't there. day, yeah. Um, when we were, yeah, they weren't there. Nobody else had showed up except yeah. for you. Yeah. Um, but on when we were when we were there on the final day and we're at the high school in, on the on the football field, um, I got wind that this Washington Post article had come out about James that I want to pull up right now. Yeah. Um, which we both kind of read together standing on the football field. Well, yeah, Sonny, Sonny, uh, who's James's wife. Um, comes up to me and says, you know, don't do what the Washington Post uh, did. I'm like, wait, what? Yeah. <laughs> so then we read this thing. So we read this article. Uh, yeah. It's titled through pain and controversy. The Iron Cowboy right. chases a hundred triathlons in a hundred days. The first, uh, how does this open? Um, The second paragraph, did they? Oh yeah, so so when it's describing James, the paragraph introducing him basically says, billing himself as the quote unquote, Iron Cowboy, Lawrence aims to conquer a hundred full distance triathlons in a hundred days. And this art, which is kind of like a little bit of a backhanded, not so nice way of introducing him. Um, this article proceeds to chronicle what he's attempting to do but it does it in a, a very kind of condescending way and chooses to focus on things that I think are not the point. There's no mention of the community and all these people that have come out. This, this journalist didn't show up on the day, uh, you know, for any aspect of this to be boots on the ground to experience what was happening and focused on things like, oh, he takes an IV at night, which is basically- A couple what, times a week. Yeah. To, to help himself recover, which James has been extremely transparent about. Yeah. He, he basically tells you what he's doing and shows you and says what's in the IV. Uh, and it's essentially the same thing that you would get if you completed an Ironman and went into the tent afterwards, and, yeah. which is what a lot of people do at those races. Yeah. Um, and then a bunch of other stuff that just really is a distraction from um, what, he's, what he was attempting to do without a lot of recognition around just how extraordinarily difficult this is. Um, the, the kind of um, uh, groundbreaking, you know, legendary aspect of doing something that nobody had ever done before. Right. And uh, I, I just thought it was lazy and uncool. I was like, why are you- You thought it was a hit writing? piece. Yeah, it's, it's like a hit piece. Right. And why even write this article? Um, I, don't, well, I didn't understand it. The, uh, I, I can't speak for that reporter, but most likely he would have loved to come out and he probably just didn't get approved mm -hmm. to come out. Um, and that's a, just a guess from, from me, a guy sitting in a room. I have right. no idea, I have no connection to this reporter or to the Washington Post, but. Um, it, it focuses on, on criticism and controversy um, yes. with respect to his charity of choice and also um, some grumblings within the triathlon community. There was a yes. bit of a controversy when he did the 50-50-50 because of weather conditions and logistics, he was forced to do, I don't know how, like a marathon or two on an elliptical, um, which was not his preference, which made people think, well, he didn't really do well, this it was, thing. it was, I think there were a couple of things. One was like, he did everything indoors on a bad weather day. And then the yeah. other thing he had an injury and he said, and I think he did the marathon on the elliptical because as long as he's indoors, why not do that? Which mm -hmm. will, or something like that, that's so in it his gave, book. It gave people a reason to take him down a notch. Right. And there's a snarkiness to all of this. And I think one of the and reasons And it talks about why, WADA, right? Like, and like, yeah, like what does WADA think of him right. doing these IVs? And right. does this really count as a record? Right. Is this really a record at all? The fact that the discussion is around whether or not this is a record, like who cares? I don't care if it's a record. No. Who cares if it ends up in the Guinness Book of World? <laughs> it's like, right. that's not the point. The point is this guy went out and did something unbelievably hard. He did it with his friends. 
He did it with whatever support that he could muster and he impacted thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people around the world who are now rethinking their own perception of personal capability. And That's right. the fact that this article didn't acknowledge any aspect of that, I think is irresponsible. And it bummed me out that this article even existed. To me, it's, it's really a story that should be all about um, basically what the thing is called conquering, you know, it the is. impossible, and, and doing if, this impossible thing and the impact that it's had on other people. And you see other athletes, you know, the, the tr- it's, it's very telling in who's flocked to kind of be a part of this thing and, and people from all backgrounds all over the country, he's getting messages from all over the world. Other athletes are super impressed. Um, that was the big thing. Yeah. Well, like Tommy Rives came out, yeah. you know, who's recovering from cancer, yeah. still in his struggle, um, and got through six miles with James, which was huge. Um, but the other thing is that uh, because there was this controversy with the 50 50 50, with the elliptical and whatnot, um, he really wanted to, you know, quiet all of that and put it to bed. So, that's one reason I think that he decided to do a hundred and then do a hundred and one. Right. And along the way, if you go to places like Slow Twitch, which is notorious for you know a cantankerous you know forum section where people like to take people down a peg, um, he basically turned the tide there and now has essentially unanimous support from the endurance and multi-sport community at well, large. You know, it's funny is that one thing he said that was disappointing and the, the whole team was saying is that the local uh, triathlon community did not turn out for him. And and um, they never really understood why. Uh, during the 50, he was getting a lot of support until this that elliptical thing happened. And then I don't know what mm-hmm. happened, it fell apart. But in uh, the 100, they weren't showing up. They weren't showing up to the swims. They weren't showing up to the bikes. They weren't showing up to the runs. Uh, the 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 people that really showed up were the cyclists in Linden and around there. A lot of there. cyclists. A lot of cyclists there's would turn up. a lot of up. cyclists in that area. Because they were doing something of a criterion in the middle of Payson, like a 14 mile loop. They would do it like three or four times. They'd ride there and then they would do the, the, they'd do the loop and then they'd ride back. And so some, they would have like, the leaders, they would they would be in the peloton, kind of like you said, in the cut, you know, like, the, and this arrowhead of riders would take turns and they'd switch off and they'd go hard and lead the pack and, mm-hmm. and break wind. Um, and so the cyclists really were heroes. And then the everyday people who turned up um, were heroes. So it is um, weird yeah. that the triathletes couldn't show up for him. Yeah, he, they I thought it was weird, it, but you know. A, it's a weird cultural thing. Right, and it's weird. And, and I understand like, you know, look, for for whatever it is, we we when you see a story that's duplicitous or has m- s- several aspects to it, there's something about that that's good. But at the same time, yes, you could. There's this version of a story where a lot of people told the story without getting into the controversy. They just wanted to tell the story of this guy doing this hard thing, um, and and so, you know some editors like the 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 multi pronged approach because it's a more nuanced story and it's a little bit more just something to chew on. Um, Personally, I was just glad to be there and witness it. That last day, that finish was was remarkable. Um, to get up every day with him, and and even for me, just to get up every day, <laughs> go to the pool was hard. <laughs> I mean, at five a.m. Yeah. and he's getting five hours of sleep, and he was like the stuff that didn't get into my story is his sleep was not like you'd expect him just to collapse and like sleep hard like a rock for five hours. He said he was having night terrors. Yeah, waking up screaming. He told me about that. Yeah, night terrors, sweating profusely. Mm-hmm. Like his sleep score, he had this bio tracker thing and he was getting terrible sleep scores. Yeah. So he would go home at the end of the day, get on the massage table, get worked on, fall asleep on the massage table, move to the couch, get the, Nor- the, the um, Normatec boots on and essentially fall asleep. But he never slept deeply. He would have crazy dreams. Mm. He was sleepwalking somewhat, <laughs> night terrors. I never had night terrors. It's no. like, wacky. Crazy. And then on top of the whole thing, I wanna get into kind of where he's at now physically yeah. and emotionally. Um, he was telling me on day 91 that he could, that for a long time, he hasn't been able to feel anything in uh, his, two of his toes on his left foot. The, not the big toe, but the two next to the big toe. Yeah. And he said, I'm probably gonna have to, you know, it, it's a nerve thing that probably has to do with his back and his hip or something like that. Um, but he has no feeling in them and they might have to get 
removed and he was okay with that. <laughs> it's his idea, I think. <laughs> He's like, let's just get rid of them. <laughs> They've caused me nothing so but the trouble these toes. to which this guy has gone. Yeah. The extent to, please do not be confused. Like this guy has taken his body to the brink. Yes. And if you've been following him in the days that have elapsed since he's completed this, you see somebody who's struggling right now. He immediately came down to LA and went to UCLA to have all these tests done. They put him on the stationary bike. He breaks the record. Yeah, crazy. <laughs> so, I don't know what the record is in the hospital or whatever, right. but whatever it was, he broke it. 6% body fat, um, but brain fog, he's having trouble with his thinking and his speaking. Yeah. Um, I think he's struggling a little bit, you know, kind of emotionally. I would with, imagine. Existentially. With, well, he was on this great, he was saying like he gets up journey. in the morning and he just wanders around. He doesn't know what to do. Right. You know, it's like his body is so traumatized and was in this survival mode for so long. And it's reckoning now with like what comes next. And yeah. we'll see. We'll see how that plays out. We'll see. Um, of course, I want to get him back on the show, but, yep. you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not like, you know, when he's ready, you know, he knows he has an open invitation here and he knows how much. I love him and how much uh, this audience loves and appreciates him. So he knows he's welcome. And when he's ready to come on, um, we'll get him back on the show. He, uh, he told me that it's, it, he, he can't even unpack it yet. So the longer you wait actually might be better in terms of unpacking some of the details. Yeah. yeah, he is incredibly gifted also at, at basically dropping these wise speeches at the end of every day. Like he's done this whole thing yeah. and then he'll give this inspirational five to 10 minute speech at the yeah. end of every day. Like he has a command on the power of what he's doing and how it impacts other people. And he's developing a, a greater and greater facility or capacity to communicate that in a way that's impactful to people as well. Boom. So we love you, James. We wish you well. We were proud and happy to be able to be there. Um, to bear witness and to and to support you as you completed this crazy thing. So, any final thoughts on that? What is it? I just all, want my what story to mean? come out. <laughs> yeah. What is this? I mean, you turned it in. What's going on? I mean, on? technically, I'm going to. How I'm, does this newspaper function? <laughs> Apparently, there's other stories out there. <laughs> um, you know, I get sometimes antsy when stories get held, especially when you when you are you like them and you want them out there. Um, and I'm sure the Lawrence family wants it too. Uh, but the good thing about the New York Times is the reach is great and their skill at storytelling is great. So um, it tends to land well whenever it comes out. I remember the Maya Gabera story, which is one of the best performing stories I've, I've done probably ever. Um, uh, you know, they held that for like two, three weeks or mm -hmm. something. And I was really antsy Do about that Do they tell one. you what the traffic is? Do they give you analytics on how well your story does or how many people have read it? No, I get general kind of feeling from it though. You know, like it's, that's proprietary stuff and I, I'm not on staff there. So I don't really uh, ask for specific numbers and they wouldn't be obligated or it wouldn't be wise for them to tell me anyway. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I have a good relationship with my editors there and they let me know when things are going well, when it's pinging all over the world and what's doing well. So right. typically these things do do well. Um, they do better than the typical sports stories that they that they run. Yeah. yeah. Well, we need a good follow-up to the woman who fell two miles to earth. I, well. <laughs> and this might just be the thing. Yeah, maybe. Right? I, I hope so. I hope people like it. Um, and I think it's an interesting read. I, I get into what he consumed on day 99 in this, in, in the story and his food all, intake. Yeah, yeah. Which is worth, I'll, I'm not going to, I'm not going to spoil that. That's a good one. Right. Well, yeah. we're recording this on Monday, June 21st. Yep. It will publish on June 24th, perhaps in the intervening days. Should be. The, the story will come out. Should, should. If it has or it hasn't, if it has, of course, we'll link it up in the show notes and in the description on YouTube. Um, but if it hasn't come out by that point, we'll be sure to let everybody know and direct attention to that. Perfect. Cool. Well, let's take a quick break and we'll be back with wins of the week and my conversation with Jacob Fry. And we're back, Adam, let's do some wins of the week. Let's go. What you got? First up, we have the Great Lakes Jumper. I love the Great Another Lakes Jumper. Another New York Times story. This is the story of a man who jumped into Lake Michigan every day for nearly a year. That's literally the headline of the the article, yeah. I'm gonna pull it up right here. I love this piece. Mm. Um, you love it too, right? I do love it. I love it. Uh, I love it for a couple of reasons. Um, 
so this is a guy who basically lives in Chicago and at the start of the pandemic was struggling like a lot of people. And I don't know what came over him, but he decided that he was gonna jump into Lake Michigan. And that day turned into a second day, turned into a streak that he has um, stuck with for over a year at this point. Yeah. Literally jumping in year round into Lake Michigan. He makes, I guess he makes like hand stencil t-shirts for bands and travels around to festivals. And when all that went away, um, he didn't know what to do with himself, but he has these yeah, he had, relationships with musicians and he would have musicians come out and play live at like 1030 in the morning <laughs> when he, while he would jump into the lake and he was sharing this on Instagram and everybody just kind of fell in love with this guy. 53 year old guy, what's his name? Dan O'Connor. Uh, O'Connor. And Julie Bossman did the story. I think it's a great story. Cause it's like, what I love about it and Julie gets into this in the story, um, one of the reasons I love it is is that we've been taking ourselves way too seriously <laughs> as a right. culture. He just I mean, got tired of politics. He yeah. got tired of the bullshit. Yeah, and he just needed something pure. Here's right. a little. Let me play this like Instagram well, to me, clip of him yeah. jumping in. Because this is what he would do. Uh, he would literally day. jump in. He would do cannonballs yeah. and all sorts of things. Right. I don't know if we can get the sound on this. Probably not. Um, this is his cannonball. Here he is. Yeah. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> 41 degree air, 44 degree water. Good for him. There's another one of him uh, jumping in in the ice. Well, there he is doing a, a flip. flip with the musician. And uh, where's the one of him in the ice? That's crazy. Yeah, he'd have to chip away. He had to chip away. 22 degrees out. Mm. And he had to chip away at ice. Mm-hmm. And it's not Wim Hofian. There's nothing optimizing about this. No, it's just joy. It's just pure joy. And like, I love this. Cause like, this is what we need. We don't need this <laughs> unnecessary counterproductive, like jabbering at each other. We just need some dude willing to jump, <laughs> flop into the, into, into the water lake every day that's, that's to all remind we us that we're all human. <laughs> life you is know? not, sometimes this is what you have to do. Yeah. I had a period in time in my life, I think it was 2005 where like things I didn't, I felt like I didn't know where I was in my life. And that's what I started to do. It was like February or something. And I started to do mm-hmm. every day for 40 days. Cause I was like big into Kundalini yoga at the time. And, you know, as Guru Singh says, sometimes every, after 40 days, you're, the cell were, the cells in your blood, you have fully recycled. So like you've kind of recharged. That's why they do 40 day meditations in Kundalini yoga. And so it was kind of like that. I would walk down from my apartment to the beach and jump in the ocean and just swim past the waves and bob around a little bit and come back. And I did every day. Mm -hmm. It turned out to be like 60 days by the time I was done. Um, It did help, you know, like, and I wasn't open water swimmer at the time. I wasn't doing a lot of that. And so I was certainly wasn't in love with the cold water yet. Um, And so there's something about the power of surrendering to like that ritual. Sometimes you need a ritual like that to like get your mind right. Yeah. I mean, what's not to love about this guy? Look at him. I love it. Just floating in the in the lake, man. Sometimes that's you know that's what life's about. Yeah, not not this, not what <laughs> we have going on here. That um, there's a couple things I wanted to mention about this though, because there's there's a, there's a few uh, analogies here that okay. I wanted to draw attention to. One of which is it's reminiscent of what the happy pair guys have been doing for a couple of years at this point. Um, people who listen to the podcast are familiar with David and Stephen Flynn. They live in Greystones, Ireland, which is about an hour south of, of Dublin. Mm. They run a veg shop. They're prolific on social media, sharing this message of healthy, vibrant living, um, super fit, identical twins. And a couple of years ago, they just started jumping into the Irish Sea every morning at dawn. Like, and that became their routine and they would share it on Instagram and Instagram stories. And slowly but surely people started showing up to do this with them. And now there are days where hundreds of people show up to do this and they do it year round. It doesn't matter how cold it is. And then they all congregate on the beach and share a bowl of porridge and have breakfast and tell stories. And sometimes there's a campfire and they've really created this amazing movement and community around just getting into cold water every single day. Greystones, Ireland? Greystones, yeah. It's a little village about an hour. It's it's sort of a suburb, but it's its own thing about an hour so, south of Dublin. Um, so those guys have been doing their version of this for, for quite a while. I was there for an early uh, 
incarnation of it. And mm. that water is cold, man. I got to tell you. <laughs> so you did do it. Um, yeah, I've done it with them. That's cool. Uh, secondly, there's something about this idea of streaks, like mm-hmm. the idea that you're going to do it every single day, no matter what, like mm. the happy pair guys, like this guy in Chicago, um, which leads me to think about a guest that's coming on this week, Hella Sidibe, who is on this extraordinary run day streak. He's run over 1400 days consecutively mm. without missing a single day, including being the first uh, black guy to run across the United States, which Amazing. he completed um, a couple of weeks ago. So he's coming on the show this week. I'm not sure when we're gonna air that, but I'm sitting down with him. That's and, exciting, I love and I him. And I think this idea of streaks, it's like, no matter what, this guy's gonna run. And no matter what, that dude's gonna jump into Lake Michigan and the happy pair guys are gonna get into the Irish Sea. And when you prioritize it and create momentum around that consistency, look what can happen. Mm. It's kind of an amazing, powerful, mystical thing. It is, it is mystical. Cause it's not, it's not about trying to get ahead or get anywhere other than just do that one thing. And that, that's yeah. the power of it, you know? Right. Um, it's surprising with the guy in Chicago that there aren't people showing up to do it with him. There were, they, like, there were, I not think- Not like huge crowds. Right, right, right. You know? Just towards the end, I think he had like, like a, dude a, a cookout. Guitar. Yeah, <laughs> he had a couple bands. Um, but I, I like that Hella is is coming on. He's he's also, he's I saw best. him um, commenting supportive message on um, Iron Cowboy's yeah, Instagram. Too. Yeah, I did Which too. was cool um, to see that. I mean, yeah. even the Iron Cowboy, 100 days in a row, same idea. Right, consistency, yeah. streaks. Momentum. I've changed a, a, a diaper theme. like. I see a theme. Uh, how many days in a row is that now? Well, you've been breathing consistently <laughs> for you. many days in a row. <laughs> I have. <laughs> we all do things consistently without thinking about right. it. Right. What can we add on? And when you look at it, when you just make it the priority and you yep. orient your life around that, these things that seem daunting suddenly become rote. And when you take them, in bite-sized chunks, just, I don't have to worry about tomorrow, just today. How am I gonna get my run in today? Yeah. How am I gonna jump in Lake Michigan today? That's all it is. That's it, man. A um, Couple more wins of the week. Yep. We got, I wanted to shout out um, Jason Caldwell and this great Pacific race that's happening right now. It's a 2,400 nautical mile event of rowing that started on May 31st, um, where Jason and his team of four along with a couple other teams are attempting to row from San Francisco to Hawaii, to Honolulu. Um, I guess only 22 teams and 60 people have ever completed this race. Uh, You did some research on this. It looks like it launched in 2014. Yeah, it's held every two years, launched in 2014. The record was set of 39 days, that what we said? Yeah, 39 Mm -hmm. days in uh, 2016. the pandemic delayed last year's race. So now they're on to odd years. You can put in your application for 2023 yeah. right now, Rich. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, That's something I won't be doing. Yes. It, uh, but I've got mad respect for Jason and his, and his teammates uh, oh, yeah. for tackling this thing. The first half of the race apparently saw some big conditions out there in the seas and yeah. it's been glassier lately. Um, they're on day 22, I day think. Day 22, was and it 21 or 22? The world, the world record is 39 days. 39 days. So they're well into it at this point. They're on day 22, yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes. Um, what's interesting about this event is you would think if you just got the four best rowers in the world, you would crush it, but that's not really how this works. You certainly need people who are very good at rowing, mm. but what's more important is finding people who are experienced in adversity and adventure sports. Like how are you gonna deal with being wet all the time and having your sleep disrupted and vomiting because of the way, like all the conditions that get thrown at you and the variables, et cetera. So one of the things, Jason is an extraordinarily accomplished adventure athlete. This guy's crossed the Nabib Desert. He's rode the Atlantic twice. Uh, The first time he broke the American record, despite two of his crew being airlifted for medical reasons. Then he came back with a new team and broke the world record. Um, He's done all kinds of uh, things in different terrains and environments. Mm -hmm. And he's got these other uh, teammates, Angus Collins, Gus Barton, and Duncan Roy. The same guys are back? Um, I don't know, I should do a little bit more research on this, but these guys are not all like collegiate 
accomplished rowers. Jason's got a, obviously a background in rowing, um, but I think there's a diversity of experience and background that these guys all bring yeah. that allow this kind of, this to function optimally as, as a team sort of experience. The the video on his Atlantic race is is really telling. I don't think it's the same three guys from the Atlantic race, but the guy one of the guys from the Atlantic race who was the best rower was actually not used to rowing in open ocean, mm-hmm. and so he had really bad seasickness for the first twenty four something hours, um, and it looked like it was going to be another airlift situation. But they right. were able to stabilize him and get him some rest, and then he became a real valuable asset, just crushing it down the stretch. They're in these kayaks, similar to how Colin O'Brady and his team. Yeah, it's a si- it's the same kind of boat. Yeah. Kayak is the wrong word. I mean, these are large boats. Yeah. So two people, I think two people are rowing at a time and the other two are sleeping. They do these shifts. Yep. So they're literally going around the clock. Two two at a it. time. It's four. Most teams have four people. The other two teams in the water, we should note, are all female teams. Right. There's the Ocean Shiros, which are hot on the tail of the guys. I, I don't know how far, they, they're probably a good ways back, but if you look at the tracker, they look like they're hot on their tra- right, right, <laughs> tails, right. but they're doing great. I mean, they're right there. And then the girls who dare, um, are having a little bit more trouble. They're going south. It looks like they're going south to catch a Western current. So, mm. um, so they're still in it though. They're still going. They're 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 in Baja area. I mean, both these they've gone a long way. They're already very south and yeah. west, and they're well on their way to breaking a record here. And the Ocean Shiros might actually get that thirty nine day record too. Mm. Um, they're 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 cruising, um, and they're a great follow also on Instagram too. Right. So I just wanted to put this on people's radar as this story rapidly unfolds. You can follow it. Best place to follow it is on Instagram at LAT35 racing, LAT the number three, five racing where there's a bunch of updates here and you can kind of pay attention and keep tabs on these guys. And the Great Pacific Race will have a, a link to click if you wanna see their tracker. And then mm-hmm. you can see how the, how the three teams are doing. Right. But so basically there are three teams four men and seven women attempting to do this. I just, somehow I think that's really cool that right. like there's that many uh, badass women out there going for it too. It's very cool. So yeah. if they make it safely, we'll see if we can get uh, Jason on the podcast to tell us all about it. Dope. So this is the point where we were gonna pivot to Jacob Fry, but there's one more thing that, that we discussed this morning that you wanted to talk about. Should we or do you, should we? No, let's do it. Okay. Why not? Let's do it. So go for it. Well, um, we, you know, this Supreme Court case just got a verdict, just got ruled on a Supreme Court case about uh, amateurism in American sport. And basically it was about the NCAA, um, which rules all college athletics. And they were trying to preserve things, the status quo, which is you have to be an amateur to play college sports. So that means even though these athletes in cases of football and baseball who make millions and hundreds of millions of dollars for universities and for the NCAA, um, they don't get paid anything. So then when they do take a benefit, maybe under the table, they're they're somehow painted as corrupt and they've done and they're suspended and the burden of that is on them. And often they might come from families that don't have a lot of money and don't have a lot of opportunity outside sport, especially when you're talking about football and and basketball and largely black. Um, And so the burden always falls on them. And the funny thing about amateurism is it's always been used as a cudgel against people that didn't have money or didn't have uh, you know, didn't have options. Um, even the Olympics, they, you know, used to be thought of as if you're an amateur athletic, there's some, some amateur athlete, somehow that's more pure. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we should hold that up, but that often kept Olympians impoverished or even all the way back to Duke and Jim Thorpe, which we talked about in the last roll on, uh, those guys both came from backgrounds where they didn't have a lot of money and didn't have a lot of opportunity. And Duke was able to be taken care of by people in Hawaii that allowed him to keep his amateurism. Otherwise he would have been um, disgraced and have his ha, had his medal stripped just like Jim Thorpe, who was arguably the best athlete of his era. And so um, that's been hanging over the NCAA and slowly but surely people have been trying to get rid of it. And the Supreme Court unanimously ruled that that amateurism cloak is gone. You can't pay athletes, whatever, you know, it's not open market like free agency and professional sports, but 
you are gonna be able to give more benefits. There's gonna be less limits on that. There'll be stipends that will be allowed. There'll be all sorts of things that will give all athletes in every sport, basically opportunities that they didn't have before. Yeah, I mean, the way I look at this is that it's just a crack, you know, the door is starting to open Yeah. because this is a very narrow ruling. It's not busting open the floodgates so that these NC2A athletes can start profiting off their likenesses and right. their social media and get paid like professionals. It's a very narrow application of a particular law that allows them to get compensation for education related stuff, right? Yes. Like it's complicated, but the point being that this is a small piece in a much larger puzzle. And I'm glad that this is happening. I wish that it was going further and faster because I think it's preposterous that these college athletes are not being compensated while the NC2A is, is, is enriching itself to, you know, a, a, an extreme extent and mm. so much of how these colleges operate functions on taking advantage of these athletes to sort of learn, you know, like sort of gird their coffers. Mm. And I, I just find it in 2021 to be exploitive and extremely distasteful. And I think more importantly, when you look at this more broadly from the perspective of what are, what are colleges doing in general and where have we lost our way? I think there is an argument to be made for shining a light on the kind of scammy nature to which univer the university system and colleges in general are exploiting not just athletes, but students in general. This is something that Scott Galloway, who's a professor of business at NYU um, and also kind of a YouTube and podcast star mm. has been ranting about for a while, but he makes some really good points, which is basically that higher education has been squeezing students for 30 years. Tuition has exploded. It's up 1400% since 1978, which is 15, it's a 15 X increase in the last 40 years. And the tuition to salary ratio used to be 25%, meaning you pay this certain tuition, but you can expect to earn this much when you get out into the workplace. But that 25%, 25 25 times, 25X, I mean. I mean, is now dwindled to 1.4X. Crazy. So these numbers are, are, are out of whack. Meanwhile, housing costs have escalated from 2.8 times one's average starting salary to 10 times one <laughs> salary. So you, you can't, Make you can't make it work. No, and these colleges, you know, to coin Scott's phraseology, are essentially luxury brands that are driven by artificial scarcity to create irrational margins. And the colleges are drunk on this scarcity because they can create such massive demand for entrance. Meanwhile, they have these billion-dollar endowments, mm -hmm. um, and you know when universities used to, you know, once aspire to be public servants, they're now just these these brands, and it doesn't make sense when you have these massive endowments. Tuition costs are insane, and even when you look at someone like Scott or any typical university professor, and you compare uh, how it breaks down in terms of what a student has to pay to attend a certain class versus what that college professor is being paid to teach that class, it's also completely out of whack. It's something like a 90% commission hmm. on professors. So the point being that the exploitation um, is extreme with the athletes, but it's also exploitation across the board with students. And I think COVID presented an opportunity for us all to reimagine what this system could look like because driving this artificial scarcity really doesn't make sense anymore. Like if Yale has, an entering class of, I don't even know what it is, 2,000, 3,000 people. Why can't that be 50,000 people at a much reduced tuition price where you're in this hybrid virtual, you know, learn from home situation? Like if you really wanna be a public servant and if your priority is to provide higher education at a, at a cost effective point to the most number of people, we're capable of doing that but these universities want to protect the fact that they are luxury brands and that that's established by making it rare in the sense that a diamond is rare it's it's great all great points i think gladwell did it in one of his first seasons oh, of revisionist he goes history off on this stuff. yeah 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 yeah, yeah. he did something and i think he profiled this. like vassar or smith or the, it, one of the one of those two the only like high-end college that actually uses its endowment for the students yeah. like to actually get poor students to come in and pays their entire way right. out of their endowment. 
um, which is what you're basically advocating. And, and, and it's not just exploiting students because it's exploiting all families because who's paying for the, you know, sometimes it's the, it's the student getting into debt. Sometimes it's the family themselves, put, you know, having to save and scrape together money over the course of an entire working life and then put it into the hands of these, you know, white tie, white shoe. <laughs> <laughs> the idea that young trustees. people are going out in the workplace straddled with extraordinary debt in an era where we're bailing out airlines and right. car companies and right. bankers to the extent that we're doing, it just it it just becomes really unpalatable. It does. And that's what has driven this incredible distrust, which we sh- is a great way to pivot to kind of the guy you had, to, you're right. sitting in, in one of the toughest positions in politics. You know, his job is probably the hardest job in politics, other than maybe uh, you know the president during a pandemic. I know, and um, because because of all these things that are true, because of all these flaws in systems that we've always kind of figured ran the world, um, and then the exposure of that, and then the backlash against that, and the outrage kind of spiral that happens. There's such low trust in institutions, and mm-hmm. partly because of what you're saying, because they, they, you know, there's the an exploitive nation. Have, yeah, they, yeah, and they've betrayed right. their mission statements and the people that rely on them. So then, what if you are a mayor cut from the same cloth as like a liberal, kind of like a, you know, not to compare him to Obama, but someone who like is running a hope and change type campaign yeah. and wants to then take the mantle of an institution that is derided. At this this time, what what a what a difficult you're, you're in an impossible situation. Yes, yes. Because Jacob Fry really is of that political ilk. Yeah. He is a hope and change progressive who you know comes into this situation looking to you know like sort of uh, build bridges mm. in a bipartisan way, and he finds himself in a situation in which his city is literally at war with itself and on the precipice of total implosion. And no matter what he does, he will be derided and criticized. He's either not progressive enough or he's way out of bounds progressive. Every measure and every move that he takes is under the microscope of uh, of the world because right. all attention is focused on Minneapolis in the wake of George Floyd and the trial and everything going on there. So. The pressure could not be more enormous on that individual. And what interest, interested me about him and the reason to, to speak to him was not to have an in-depth conversation about policy and his politics, but more to understand the human being who's weathering these kinds of hits, hmm. the kind of guy who has gotten into Twitter beefs with Donald Trump. And I feel, you know, if I if I give him a charitable interpretation, he's really trying to do the right thing, and you may disagree or agree with how he's trying to do that. But maintaining peace in a city poised to explode is a is a tall order. Mm. Um, you have to set matters to rights. You got to acknowledge the wrongs. You got to make the appropriate changes, and you have to do all of this under the spotlight, as I mentioned, of the world, where half the people think he's doing not enough, and the other half think he think think that he's bowing too much. So the conversation that I wanted to have with him was really about that, not politics, but how one manages the stress and pressure uh, that he has had to shoulder and what it feels like to have to make really important, difficult, and at times no win decisions while the world watches. And also the fact that this guy is not for nothing, probably the most accomplished runner in elected office in America. Right, that, that's right. That's this is, that, this is that, crazy. That was another big piece of what this, an, right? What an unbelievable right. runner this guy is. This is a guy who, uh, in addition to being mayor of Minneapolis, um, is a former professional runner. He trained with Des Linden back in the day. He was repped by Saucony. He got fourth in the marathon at the 2007 Pan American Games in Rio, where he ran 216 crazy. for the marathon. And then in 2008, he outright won the Austin Marathon, like he didn't win the amateur, like he won the whole thing. Right, right, right. This is the mayor of Minneapolis. He's a young guy, he's got a baby. Um, It's kind of an extraordinary situation. So of course, when the opportunity presented itself to talk to this guy uh, while I was in Minneapolis, 
of course I'm going to take that opportunity did, did Brogan, to try to did Brogan yeah Bro, yeah because Brogan's friends with him okay and set that whole thing in motion um, and I think it's important to note that that I it, look Jace, Jacob came to the interview in good faith like and and um, I really appreciate him taking the time to to talk to me but for all the reasons we just mentioned, the guy is in a pickle. Like it's not in his Still, interest right? to, it hasn't gotten... to have like an emotional, you know, no. vulnerable conversation with me about his life. Like he's trying to hold everything together. It's still, um, it's still, it like, still is. Right? So, what, what's the latest there? Well, here we are um, in June, but on June third, they just uh, they they dismantled George George Floyd Square. Um, there's an article about this in the New York Times that I can pull up. And they did it, uh, two things about this. First of all, they, did, they didn't announce it ahead of time, just mm-hmm. one dawn on, on the third, the, at, dawn, at dawn on the third, they started dismantling the, the, the barriers. Yeah. Um, and they, secondly, they did it in, in partnership or cooperation with the Agape Movement, right. which is a community organization that I was able to encounter. Like I met with some of these people when I visited George Floyd Square got to know a couple of them. What they does your podcast do? Yeah, that's the guy from the Agape movement is the dude who said, what does your podcast do? Yeah, that's the guy. He was the Agape, one of the Agape dudes. Um, and so the Agape movement has taken some hits for cooperating with this from, from uh, liberal minded folk who did not want these barriers taken down. So it's, it's controversial. Um, the Agape movement is funded by the city. I think they got a couple hundred thousand dollars. So that of course, you know, caused some criticism. And if you're Jacob, like there's this balance between recognizing and acknowledging and memorializing the importance of everything that has transpired in Minneapolis, but there's also a countervailing force uh, and, and quite a few people who want the road back open and the businesses that are inside that square who wanna reopen as well. Mm. Um, how do you make the right call? How do you do what's right? Is there a right answer to how to resolve this? And these are, that's just one of, you know, probably several types of issues that, you know, Mayor Fry has to deal with every single day. Crazy. So I've always said, whoever was in office in 2020 in like, as an administrator, mayor, governor, president, I would like to see how many keep their jobs it's not going to be many. It's so rough. Yeah. The mayor job is an interesting one though, because you actually have a lot of power. You have more power as a mayor to actually do stuff and get stuff done than most elected officials. Didn't Garcetti just take an ambassador post to, cut down to get out? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't think he was expecting know. a win. <laughs> um, well, we got a lot more to come. So why don't we cut it there and Good. give it now to my conversation with Mayor. Jacob Fry. Well, super nice to meet you, man. I, I appreciate you taking time out of Absolutely. your busy life to sit down and I'm excited to talk to you, man. I am too. Yeah. Um, I mean, first of all, uh, I'm glad that I'm not walking in your shoes right now. I can't imagine the level of stress and strain that uh, your life delivers to you on a daily basis. Um, it's gotta be a lot to just shoulder everything that this city throws at you. So how do you, like, what is your routine to just maintain your equanimity throughout everything? It is heavy, there's no doubt about it. And it's both not about me, which Mm. I fully recognize. I mean, this 100 year in the making reckoning around racial justice is not about me specifically as mayor, but. Uh, obviously I'm very involved uh, as the mayor of Minneapolis. And you know, you feel that weight every single day. Yeah. Um, I have a little bit of a mantra that I tell myself every morning when I wake up. Um, the first thing I tell myself is find a way. That's always been my mantra. You know, mm-hmm. find a way for whatever it is that you're trying to figure out, whatever problem you're trying to solve, uh, whatever uh, form of, of justice or equity you're trying to accomplish, it's find a way. Um, but then there's a few simple principles that I live by beyond that. And sometimes when you're going mm-hmm. through the most strenuous uh, difficulty, that's all you can do. It's first tell the truth, you know, be honest, no matter what. Second, you try to do what's right. And obviously uh, what is right is oftentimes up for debate. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and then the last thing is you just try your hardest and you keep putting one foot in front of the other and that's all you can do. Yeah. Um, so it's that mantra. And then of course it's running. I mean, running has always been some form of release for me mm -hmm. and has become more of a release since I stopped doing it seriously. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wanna talk about the running. Let's just, let's just get into that yeah. now. Um, I can't imagine there is anybody in elected office in the US who's a more accomplished runner than yourself. I think you have that crown, don't you? 216 marathoner, yeah. I mean, it's unbelievable. Yeah, I don't know, it's possible. Um, uh, I feel like lately anyway, runners have been getting more and more involved in different causes, social justice, politics, et yeah. cetera, but who knows? Uh, that was certainly my previous life. Right, um, pro runner and was competing as a pro, right? Went all the way through law school or part of law school? Yeah, I. well, I, so I graduated college. I very soon thereafter moved out to join the Hansons Olympic mm -hmm. Development Program with Brooks. Which uh, is Des Lindon's program. Which was program, Desi, which yeah, she was Desi K. Davila at the time. Right. And then she, she married our, our buddy, Ryan. Uh -huh. uh, and, uh, and yeah, it was a wonderful experience out in the Hansons. They've got this amazing program where, you know, you just get up and you start running mm -hmm. with a big group of people that are doing exactly the same thing. And it becomes a whole lot easier to run very high mileage because you have that kind of camaraderie associated with it. Uh, so I did that for uh, a year and a half or so. Mm -hmm. um, and then went back and probably had my very best running years of my entire career while I was in law school. Right, so the Pan Am games, was that while you were in law school? It was. That's yeah. crazy, balancing those two things at that time. Yeah, well, for me, it was almost a sense of relief because um, once I was in law school, um, there was another outlet for energy. There was another way of thinking. I mean, you know, when I was out in Michigan, I was running, I was eating, I was sleeping, and that mm -hmm. was pretty much it. Right. Uh, and to have another concentration was actually kind of nice for me because I wasn't entirely dependent on a successful race to get a paycheck, mm -hmm. you know? And I think that in many respects was helpful and freeing in a way that actually led to some of my best running. Wow. Um, but it was also monotonous because, and lonely. You know, I mean, I'm, a, I'm an extrovert. I love yeah. people. I love talking to people. I'm, I'm so honored to talk to, you know, the, the great philosopher, Rich Roll right now, <laughs> who happens to be in our city, which is incredible. Um, uh, but you spend hours and hours in the books and studying for a, a law school exam. And then you spend hours and hours out doing 15 and seven double days, mm -hmm. uh, which is boring. Right, no and way were you around. doing that on your own or were you running with a group, like a crew when you were uh, in law school? The vast majority of it was on my own. Uh, I had a, a, a slew of buddies that I'd get out for runs mm -hmm. with. There was a Kenyan team that was training a bit there too that I would run occasionally with Villanova. Mm -hmm. uh, they yeah, had a like great team well. Track team. So occasionally I'd run with a guy or two from there. Right. Um, but uh, no, by and large, it was on my own. Right. And went to William Mary on a, on a running scholarship? I had a, I think it was a half scholarship for most of the time, uh -huh. um, but yes, I uh, went to William and Mary and uh, ran through college. I was probably, I probably took it far too seriously almost at the time, mm -hmm. um, but uh, it was a wonderful spot as well. Mm -hmm. And grew up in DC. Grew up in Northern yeah, Virginia. I grew, up in, I grew up in Bethesda. There you go, just yeah. across the, the Potomac. What high school did you go to? I went to Oakton High School. Yeah, we had a hell of a team at the like, time. Uh, Reston area? Yeah, very yeah. nearby Reston. Yeah, mm -hmm. so um, actually in Reston was, was Alan Webb who was just you know a year and a half or so younger than I was. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he was a training partner through the most successful period of my running career, which was around 2007. And he, right. you know, he, Alan was busy setting the American record in the mile and he was the fastest person ever. Right, and right. I was training for the marathon, which was my top year back in 2007 as well. And so mm. um, different events and he was obviously far more accomplished than I, but uh, a good buddy anyway. Yeah, so you, so you go to the, you make the Team USA Pan American team 2000. Um, seven, seven. You, that's where you run your PR, right? To 216. Yeah. And then you won the Austin marathon like the yeah. year following. Yep, uh, maybe six or seven months later. Right. I mean, the thing that I am most proud of, of my in my running career is that, well, let me take a step back. My, my whole goal since I was like a 10 year old was to run for Team USA. 
you know, there is a tingle that you get when you put on the USA jersey sure. that you just don't get when you're wearing Saucony or Brooks or some other brand. And my goal was not just to represent Team USA, uh, but also run my absolute best. And so I represented Team USA twice at the Pan Am Games where I, I set my personal record. Um, and then at the Austin Marathon that I won. Um, and after that, I, I was, that was it. You know, I kind of got, I got done what I wanted yeah, to do. Yeah, yeah. And I had the USA jersey, which I now brag about constantly. And I hang in my office at City Hall. Uh -huh. um, and now that life is certainly a past history, but uh, I love talking about it still. Right, yeah, of course. Well, running, but running still, main, you know, maintains a huge place in your life. It is, there's I mean, you, something you're, so- you're, you're pretty trim. So you're getting out there yeah, a little bit at least. I, I think I'd be trim no matter what. It's uh -huh. just kind of the, 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 the physique or my biology. But I mean, there's something so simplistic and beautiful about running that I, that I still really love. Mm -hmm. um, and it's this direct correlation between hard work and success. That's why I originally fell in love mm -hmm. with the, support, the sport. You know, if you work harder and the guy that's standing next to you on the starting line, you're probably gonna win. Yeah. And that's also kind of what incentivized me to get into politics was, was there is a lack of that direct correlation in society. You know, if, if, if I work hard, there perhaps might be more of a direct correlation with success than somebody else, depending on mm -hmm. where they grew up or who their parents were, the socioeconomic background, race, all those things obviously contribute to the likelihood um, of whether you see that direct correlation or not. And that's, that's part of why. Yeah. Yeah. Running is, I mean, certainly there's plenty of variables that go into success, but it's relatively binary in yeah. terms of that with the work in kind of result out aspect of it. Um, and I'm interested in exploring like how that spills into how you think about policy making and leading a city, but at the same time, you're contending with you know a, a multitude of variables, most of which you have no control over. So the kind of work in result out thing starts to break down a it little does. bit yeah. in terms of you know how how you you know how you kind of make hay with your job. It does, but there are also external factors associated with running as well. I mean, people get busted up and hurt. Uh, you know, performance is is not necessarily dependent entirely on your desire to succeed, mm -hmm. but your physical condition at the time. Sometimes you just have an off day, you yeah. know? Um, but I mean, what I continue to hold pride in, I often look back on is, you know, those, those moments um, when things were clicking beautifully and running. Um, and I mean, those are some of the best days right. of my entire life. I mean, I am so lucky in that the best run that I had, race, maintenance run, workout, the best run in my entire life happened to be my most important one, mm -hmm. which was at the Pan Am Games. I mean, it was one of those days where I was wearing USA and so I was on, I was on top of the world. I felt so good. Um, and I remember being about halfway into the race uh, and I was way back, but where I was certainly predicted to be. I was one of perhaps the last individuals that mm -hmm. got the entrance. And then you start to pass one after another, after another. And then, you know, the oxygen just starts falling into your lungs. Your muscles are itching to run faster. And, and I remember thinking to myself, like, you know, this couldn't get any better. I've never felt so mm -hmm. good in my entire life. And then it, felt, then it started raining, mm -hmm. uh, which was a huge advantage for me, I thought. Uh, one, because I love running in the rain, but two, I sweat like none other yeah. when I'm running. And, and so uh, my shoes get really heavy. So I figured this was the great evener uh -huh. because everybody else's shoes would be heavy too. And I thought, you know, this is, this is just, everything was coming Double together down. at that moment. Yeah, those yeah. rare moments where everything yeah. just kind of comes together That's right. in a perfect storm. Yeah. So yeah, you did the thing, man. Did the thing, called it a day, moved on to the next right. thing. Yeah. What's interesting, I think even more broadly about the relationship between kind of running and, and um, what you do now is that fundamentally you're an endurance athlete and Minneapolis is in an endurance event right now. And what you've learned as an endurance athlete is it's just, it's about like the consistency, the persistence, the just showing up no matter what. It's like day in, day out, just keep showing up, keep showing up, keep showing up. Sometimes on a wing and a prayer, 
but you always know that if you're doing that, you're taking out the best insurance policy to get the outcome that you're seeking to get, right? And so you're kind of, you know, mind, body, and spirit trained for that type of rigor. Yeah. Does that like resonate with how Absolutely you think about it? Absolutely, it does. Yeah. I mean, the way I think about it is, especially right now, you know, uh, this last year has been like an ongoing high mileage phase. Mm -hmm. When you creep it's 100 up- 100 mile weeks every week. 100, 150 <laughs> mile weeks every yeah. week, you're, you're creeping into that high mileage phase and you're exhausted. Your body is sometimes depressed emotionally sometimes. It's hard as well. Mm -hmm. um, and the whole concept is that you put your body through hell, you adapt to that hell, then you drop the mileage and suddenly you feel like a million bucks. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, no, it's been, but, no, but during- no, no taper in sight for you at the moment. The, it's the ta and that's been, that's been one of the harder parts yeah. is, you know, nobody can operate in crisis mode for months on end. Uh, and our city enterprise has done that for about a year now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you think, I remember, I remember the beginning of COVID-19, um, I had, and this is kind of a crazy story, um, everything kind of fell apart very quickly. It became clear how horrible the pandemic was going to be. It became clear that there, it was gonna lead to a pretty significant economic downturn. It was, became clear that yeah, people were gonna get sick and yeah. tragically people were gonna die. And so we very quickly had to sign an emergency declaration. And so I, had to sign this declaration, which would give me unilateral authority around issues to act quickly mm -hmm. in the interest of the health and safety of our community. Now, at that moment, when I was signing the emergency declaration with one hand, in the other hand, I was FaceTiming with the ultrasound of my future daughter. Right. Um, and to have, you know, the most, what I thought would be probably the most important thing in my professional life in one hand, this emergency declaration is pen. And on the other hand, the most important thing in my entire life in the other, it was surreal. And I thought that that was the big test. Mm -hmm. And then, right, George Floyd was killed. Mm -hmm. um, and this global reckoning around racial justice and everything else, the economic downturn, um, budget shortfalls, everything else that our city has experienced. Right, and then you get kind of foisted into the national spotlight and conversation and suddenly there's a white hot light uh, beaming down on you and every move that you make. And you know, my sense is that no matter what you do, it's met with you know, all kinds of uh, you know, applause and derision, but no matter what it is, mainly like derision. there's but, gonna be yeah. a lot of people who are unhappy with it, right? So, yeah. so you're dealing with COVID, you're dealing with George Floyd, racial, uh, you know, the, 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 all the racial issues that have, um, you know, monopolized the conversation around Minneapolis. You've got a baby who's still now not even a year old, right? Yeah, seven all of these months, things going yeah. on, like, I mean, my head would explode. And now you're gonna, you're, you sure you wanna run for reelection? <laughs> you wanna do this again? <laughs> well, it's, it's funny. Um, the, the topic of reelection was a, a much longer one, certainly mm -hmm. with my wife than it normally is. Um, normally when you decide that you wanna be a candidate for office, uh, it's this exciting and momentous occasion. It's all right, what's the big vision and what's the coalition we're gonna build and how are we gonna get there? And it's kind of egotistical in some ways. Uh, and this time it was far more reflective. Uh, it was far more personal in some ways because, you know, there have been times when this has not been fun mm -hmm. uh, to put it lightly. Uh, it's been tough, it's been hard on my family. Uh, it's been hard on my wife, Frida has no idea. Frida's my daughter, she has no idea mm -hmm. what's going on. She's thrilled all the time. Um, but, you know, it's, uh, it, it takes on a, a new level of, of difficulty at some time. So, uh, but you know what, it, it came back to, I just feel this very deep seated responsibility, you know, to get the city through this, uh, to set an example through which 
the rest of the country, the rest of the world even can follow in mm-hmm. terms of what we are willing and able to do around, around racial justice, what we're willing and able to do around housing and police reform and deep structural change there. And uh, it's, it's hard, it's difficult. All these topics are controversial yeah. and you know, there's no easy answers to any of this stuff. Yeah, it's you know, it's a it's a platform. I mean, you campaigned on affordable housing, you campaigned on police community relations, on environmental reform, yeah. environmental justice, all of these things and then suddenly these do become the the you know, they become they become so um what's the right word? Uh, you know, prominent or in your face in a way that you could have never imagined, right? It's like, okay, well, these are the issues you want to you want to grapple with, like here you go. That's that's very real, and you know yeah. we we spent two years worth of work seeing some unprecedented progress. I mean, we invested more money on a per capita basis than almost any city in the entire country in affordable housing. Mm-hmm. We we got rid of single family exclusive zoning, which was t- to say the least very controversial, and we were the first city in the country to do that. We, there was a number of of changes that we instituted that yeah we're really proud of. Um, and this last year has been a year of unprecedented difficulty, mm-hmm. uh, unprecedented trauma and, and, and crisis. And I, I mean, I feel like too many people have used the word unprecedented in this last year. So it's almost a little bit cliche, but that's right. just the truth. During these difficult times. Yeah, yeah, every, every day I say stuff like that. And, and it's both, it feels cliche at times, but my goodness, it, it is also true. Mm-hmm. What do you see, like how, what is the vision that you hold? Like how, what is the path forward? from your perspective to get to the other side of this and create the level of parity that people would like to see and and you know hopefully uh, you know reckon with with the racial issues in a manner that um, you know sets these things aren't going to be solved obviously anytime soon but sets the city in a trajectory like that that is moving in the in the right positive direction you first always need a level of acknowledgement that hasn't been there before. And I think we are actually making some substantial progress there. You know, acknowledging that this was not just about the nine plus minutes of, of horror that we saw in the form of the video mm-hmm. of George Floyd's killing. You know, this is about 400 years worth of very intentional mistreatment. This is about intentional segregation, restrictive covenants that run with the land, Jim Crow, all of the other uh, you know, horrible and very intentional policies that mm-hmm. have been inflicted at times. And, and I think the goal right now beyond acknowledgement is to make sure that the precision of our solutions match the precision of the harm that was initially inflicted. Mm-hmm. And that's always where the rubber meets the road. Yeah. Right, I mean, because that's where people start to push back because you're talking about, all right, well, here's specifically what we're gonna do. Right. Um, but you know, these are tough conversations that are definitely worth having. And uh, I'm thankful that we are. Yeah, I mean, the wound is deep and and you can't expedite that healing. Like the, the wound has to be exposed to oxygen, right? That's right. And that feels like the phase that the city is in right now and the nation, frankly, I mean, it is weird to, to be here and then you flip on CNN or whatever. And it's like Minneapolis all day long, like wherever you go. And that's, you know, that's one of the frustrating parts in a sense, because, you know, the, the narrative that you always hear, you've heard over the last year is that, you know, Minneapolis is a city on edge. Minneapolis is a city on edge. I hear that all the time. And I won't disagree with that. Uh, There there is truth there. but we're also so much beyond that. You know, long after that red light of the cable media is gone, long after uh, folks uh, decide that they're gonna not be focusing on Minneapolis anymore for whatever reason, I mean, we're still gonna be here in the city mm-hmm. that we really love. Um, and it's an extraordinary place, mm-hmm. you know? And, uh, you know, we are, uh, this trial, we are all of these shortcomings and and issues that certainly we need to correct, and we are also so much more than that mm-hmm. at the same time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's that nuance that always doesn't get caught. You know, yeah, we're flawed, and I think the truth is that you know is that that flawed nature is certainly not unique to Minneapolis. We are there, uh, but. 
uh, we are confronting it hopefully very directly. Yeah, well, truth lives in nuance and Unfortunately, you know, media narratives are, are, are driven by kind of dualistic perspectives right. on these things. And I was reminded of my own blind spots with all of this. We went uh, to, I said this on a podcast the other day, but we went to visit George Floyd Square. Yeah. And after seeing it on television a thousand times, I thought I had an idea of what it would be and what to expect and it was, very different in every material way than everything I imagined it to be. Yeah. From the neighborhood to the setting, to the vibe, to the people, everything about it was nothing like I had imagined it. And I'd seen it a million times on television. And the reminder being that, you know, just when you think you have a grip on something, you really don't, you know, until you experience it boots on the ground. And as being the leader of this city, and your responsibility to kind of, uh, you know, shepherd a real narrative about the actuality of the events that have transpired and will transpire. What do you think, like where is the blind spot that the average person living wherever doesn't see or doesn't get about the truth of the experience of living here? The, the truth, as you mentioned, is always nuanced. I mean, you mentioned George Floyd Square. Mm -hmm. George Floyd Square is and has been both this beautiful place of racial justice and healing, uh, a critical point where communities can gather uh, and reflect. Uh, and it's also true that there are times that, that that square in that area have not been safe. Mm -hmm. um, to ignore either one of those realities would be to miss the honest truth. Um, and it is true that you know communities around there, much of them black and brown communities, uh, have suffered in some form due to some upticks in violence. Um, there's never unanimity of opinion. Yeah. There certainly is not now. Uh, but I think in that case, I mean, it, it's almost what George Floyd Square is, is emblematic of so many other things that are mm -hmm. happening right now. Um, in that you have these dualities, both of which are true, you know? Wonderful place for racial justice and reckoning and instances when it's, it's not safe due to other outside factors. Um, policing. Uh, we need deep structural change to how our police department operates. We need safety beyond policing because not every 911 call needs a response from an officer with a gun. Mm -hmm. And we need police. Mm -hmm. uh, there are horrible situations that we make officers respond to that nobody else wants to, nor can they. Yeah. Um, and both of those things are true. I think, I think the, the police reform conversation is the best kind of example to explore how truth lives in nuance, because it's very easy to lapse into this notion that with respect to Minneapolis, at least, it's either defund the police, which means a million different things to a million different right. people, but is often characterized as complete abolition of the police or your pro -militar militarization right. of the police. It's right. an either or situation. And the longer that I'm here and the more people that I talk to and the deeper I kind of educate myself about this issue, it doesn't seem like there's that much difference between most of the voices who have a say in policy making. It seems that everyone agrees that the police need deep reform. Now there's quibbling over what that might look like or how that gets implemented. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, aside from an extreme, extreme fringe, there's nobody who's really saying we need, to, we need to abolish the police department completely, at least as far as I'm aware. I don't know, you're shaking your head. Maybe you can tell me more about that. Um, and it's really a conversation about how to best accomplish this goal that there seems to be somewhat of uh, a consensus on. Is that wrong or I, No, what I think, do you think for the most part, you're right. Um, following some of those most tumultuous times after George Floyd was killed, there were definitely people that were calling for getting rid of the police. Sure, sure. Whether, whether I mean, you we wanna had, say- the, the, Can we talk about the, the video? Yeah, let's talk about the video, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know if I'm like, ever gonna live that one for, down. I mean, a lot of people probably who are listening probably saw it, but 
uh, correct me if I'm wrong, it was in the midst of a protest, you were kind of ushered out of your house and you joined this procession mm -hmm. into downtown and in front of a large number of people, um, a woman, I forget her name, uh, uh, sort of publicly asked you point blank in yes or no fashion, if you were in favor of defunding the police and you said that if she meant abolishing the police that no, you did not support that. And that resulted in you being essentially kind of told to leave and you know, shame on you and yeah, all that kind yeah. of stuff. And there's a video of you kind of walking through well, the procession of people that uh, a lot of people saw. And that mm -hmm. kind of became the lightning rod moment uh, in terms of how people were kind of contextualizing this debate. Yeah, it was tough. And let me tell you, I'm proud of that moment. Um, I'm proud because I told the truth when it was especially hard. Um, it was a large group, as you mentioned, of those protesting that came to my home um, that demanded that I come out, that were asking for answers. Um, I came out of my home and uh, I was asked to come up nearby the stage area. And yeah, I was asked if I would be willing to commit there on the spot to defunding the police. Uh, and I said very clearly that I am for deep structural change of a system that in so many cases has been racist. Uh, I think we need safety beyond policing. But let me ask you, what do you mean by that defunding the police? And mm -hmm. she said very clearly, I mean, get rid of the police. And my answer is no. Um, because that's the truth. Now, the next day, uh, I'll note that there was a strong majority, in fact, a veto-proof majority of the city council that came back and took the same pledge that I refused to take and have since, almost every one of them, gone back on it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not gonna say that I'm gonna do something that I'm not going to follow through on. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, it was tough. Um, I mean, doesn't tickle to get Game of Thrones style shamed right. in front of the national media. Uh, but, you know, when I talk to black and brown communities in our city, when I visit the North side, which I do all the time, um, there's a couple of comments that, that I get. Um, the first is, thank you for immediately terminating those officers and calling for charges. Right, those I mean, there was unanimous in, praise for you getting on that like immediately um, because that has not been handled in that type of fashion in other instances in other cities. It, it, but the second thing that I hear from our black and brown communities is thank you for standing with our chief and not agreeing to defund and abolish the police. Mm. And again, no and community so is a, and so yeah. So, what do you make of that? Well, certainly, no community is a monolith. Um, but if it's based on what I hear when I'm out on the street, if it's based on what the polling clearly says, um, it's dead in line. You know, our our again, no community is a monolith. Right. But, but what we hear loud and clear is that they want deep structural change. Mm -hmm. Do they want defunding? Uh, no. And there has been some pretty significant reformations in terms of the police, right? With the, the, the body cams and the ending of the kind of warrior training and yeah. a couple other things along the way. You do your homework, I'm impressed. A little bit. Yeah. Yeah, you know, we've made some major changes. Um, we added a disciplinary matrix to our body camera policy. When I came into office, we was about 55% compliance with our body camera policy. Um, now there's 95% compliance. Mm -hmm. So in other words, before 55% of the time they were turning on their body cameras. Right, and there's like a consequence if like, yeah. if that's not If, if they on, don't yeah. turn them on when they should, there are mm -hmm. uh, consequences to it. Uh, yeah, they're penalties. Uh, we were the first city in the entire country to ban warrior style training, both on and off duty. We overhauled our use of force policy. We banned no knock warrants for all but exigent circumstances. Uh, we've ensured that de-escalation would be added and embedded in everything that our officer is doing uh, by requirement and by the reporting structure, how it's set up. I mean, I can go on. There's a litany of other changes that we've made, but here's the truth. You know, is that gonna change the culture 
of our police department yeah. or any police department. No, it won't. These are policy changes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So to what extent do they fundamentally alter anything or are they just band-aids on a system that needs a deeper kind of redress? I think they're important changes that will help. Um, but when you talk about deeper redress, let's be specific about what we're talking about. Um, you know, one of the things that I think would make a huge difference is arbitration reform. Mm -hmm. And then I'll get a little specific on this, so we might end up just cutting this part out, but you know, this is a big deal. And I think every mayor, every chief is, is hindered by this, these laws throughout the whole country. When, we, when Chief Ardanda or I fire a police officer, it is mandated that they go through this arbitration system that sees 50% of those termination and disciplinary decisions come right back to the city. Mm. So 50% of the time when we fire somebody, that decision is not upheld because mm. of this mandatory arbitration. That needs to change. Yeah. You know, I think especially in instances of egregious use of force or uh, lying on a formal document, that should change. And you know, there's also a, a deeper issue as well, even beyond that, um, which is, you know, if you are an organization that is known for being something, you know, if if you're a a, a, a podcast that is known for attracting cool, you know, health oriented people with a good suntan, you know, uh, and then you go out and recruit. Uh, to get additional people to watch your podcast, who, who are you going to attract? You know, you, that that kind of. Mm -hmm. and similarly, if you're a police department that is known for something, whether that's for being compassionate and service oriented, or that's for being a, a bunch of racists, and you go out and recruit, who do you think you're going to get? Right. And so it makes it all the more important that you do this necessary work ahead of time to change both the reality and mm -hmm. the perceptions so that you can get the right individuals in and then the wrong individuals out. Mm. When you're faced with having to make an important decision, which you're doing constantly, and you've got all these different voices and everybody's got a perspective and a point of view and these people are donors or they're voters or they're they're coming with you know they they what what they're telling you comes with a block of voters and they can move that one way or the other what is your process for getting clarity so that you can you know tell the truth or vote with your conscience or make the best decision like is there a method to how you do that under extreme duress under times of extreme duress, especially when you're going through a, a major crisis, um, the truth is that you can't, you know, send out a poll to determine how every last individual is feeling. Um, you have community partners, you have mentors and individuals within uh, the city that you look to, that you talk to, that you get input mm -hmm. from. Um, usually, I try and take multiple sides in. You know, here. Uh, different arguments and play devil's advocate wherever I can. Uh, and then you gotta make a decision. Um, and hopefully most of the time you get that decision right. Uh, sometimes you don't. Yeah. Uh, and that's the nature of being mayor. You know, I mean, it, and it's different by the way than when you're in like Congress. I don't vote, I don't right. have a vote. Mm -hmm. um, I'm tasked with making decisions in crisis oriented situations. Mm -hmm. Um, and I mean, there's an old LBJ quote that says, you know, when the burdens of the presidency get too heavy to carry, I just thank God I'm not a mayor. Right. Um, we are dealing with all of the other situations that nobody wants to handle, mayors are. Uh, you know, I, I've half joked that the, one of the main jobs of being mayor, especially right now in Minneapolis and other cities in the country, is to jump on all of the grenades of societal shortcomings uh -huh and you still get blamed by anybody that right. get, gets hit by the shrapnel. <laughs> right. yeah. I mean, this is like the era of the mayor, right? Like when have yeah. we been talking about city mayors as much as we've been talking about them over the last 18 months? It's, it's crazy. Heavy. And it's a unique and weird job because on some level, it really is about grassroots local politics, but mayors do wield a lot of power to make swift, rapid and significant changes. And that obviously provokes the ire of a lot of people when it doesn't swing in their direction. Yeah, they both do and they, they don't at the same time. Um, I think, you know, the, the truth is that the things that, 
intrigue you and excite you and you get you get passionate about on a very deep level you know um that's congress that's the federal government in many mm-hmm. cases that's you know uh, health care um universal health care and um you know these broad sweeping you know rights I mean, marriage equality things right. like that, that in are, many cases that are debated ad nauseum yeah. and move at a very glacial pace if at all exactly um and and you can take a vote and maybe there's a chance that in a year or two you see the impact from it the things that really piss you off usually that's what mayors are dealing with uh-huh. now in these last couple of years mayors have been taking on more and i think rightfully so because there has been all of this gridlock at state and federal legislatures and so mayors have just stepped in and said we're going to just do it uh-huh. and we're going to take the wrath or the credit uh, along with it um but you know depending on which city you're in in many cases mayors have all of the author- uh, responsibility but none of the authority mm-hmm. um and in minneapolis we have uh this kind of gray system that is not a strong mayor system we do not have the system that chicago has or st paul has um we have a system that is more decentralized than yeah. that and so yeah you know you you oftentimes get blamed for things that aren't deserved. You also get credit for things that aren't deserved also. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, the, the truth is always a little bit more grayer than it's right, presented. Right. What do you think uh, like people fundamentally misunderstand the most about what your job entails? I mean, I think there's often the perception that you can wave a magic wand and make something happen immediately. Um, I think there's the perception that you have authority over things that you just don't have authority over. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's also all of the other aspects that people don't see that happen behind the scenes. Um, you know, there's these heartfelt conversations with community members. Um, there are complexities that go well beyond a hashtag on Twitter or, or a soundbite that you'll get in a two minute news conference. Mm-hmm. Uh, and often times people don't see that. And, you know, and, and this is, I think at least in part, um, a causal element of something the social media has caused yeah. over time. And there's certainly a lot of positives associated with it. There's definitely negatives too. Yeah. I mean, as somebody who, who lives you know, in the media, you're in the media constantly. I don't know that you've done any podcasts. Maybe you've done a podcast or two. I did the but daily. You did, was, oh, you did the daily, the, yeah. yeah. But that's still yeah. like pretty, that's brief, right? Like I wanted to give you the opportunity yeah. in, in kind of a, you know, a space where we can breathe, yeah. where it's like safe, where you can kind of express your perspectives without fear of it getting chopped up and right. mischaracterized or taken out of context. So in and that's, that's therapeutic. In that, and so thank you. That, yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> listen, I'm happy to do yeah. that. Um, <laughs> In that spirit, like I'm interested in, in it must be frustrating for you when you see your face, you you, sh- you pop up in some news program and they're taking some clip, or you're you know participating in one of those squawk box things where everyone's shouting and you have three seconds to express your point of view. What do you think in your message gets lost in that that you would want people to better understand? I know it's a vague question, but. You know, there have been instances when one particular event or policy has been misconstrued. Uh, for the most part, um, I've actually really appreciated the way that our media has has handled things. You know, um, of course, there are issues that I'll always be pissed off about. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that, that's inevitable. Um, what I see that is problematic, though, is the polar extremes you know the very far you know white supremacist right the very far anarchist left spinning narratives that just have no basis whatsoever mm-hmm. in reality and also seem to push to dehumanize people in a big way um you know i am a human being i have skills i have flaws I'm a human being. And every day you get up and you try to do your very best. You try to take an honest and compassionate approach. And you know, that's, 
it's, it's, it's all it's, you can do. It's, man. it's all you can do. And sometimes all that gets all that gets lost, depending yeah. on on how you know the, the those that want to speak up want to you know whether they sure. like you or not. Well, just by dint of being mayor, yeah. you become the receivership for everybody's angst and ire, or whatever's bothering them, or whatever problem that they're sure. having. Like you're, you know, you're the target for well, that. Well, and and you see, I think you know, you see both ends of it, and I think this is probably the case for so many, uh, probably elected officials, and, and I guess celebrities at times as well. You know, you're neither as good nor are you as bad mm. uh, as the media or social media makes you out to be. Mm-hmm. You know, um, there was a, there was a uh, back in 2019, I want to say, there uh, Donald Trump came to town. Right. Um, and I know where you're going with this. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. And and uh, so Donald Trump came to town. He we were forced to basically foot the bill for all of these major security expenses associated with his visit to our city. Mm -hmm. Um, And I didn't wanna pay for those security expenses. I certainly wouldn't want the taxpayer to have to foot the bill. Uh, And so we said directly to the campaign, this was not even publicly at this point. This is like, we just don't, we don't think it's right for us to do this. And then immediately, you know, the Republican party took it up the Donald Trump started going after us on social media and we responded. All that was, was a stupid tweet, right? I didn't do anything heroic, you know, but you're suddenly made into- That really put you in, a, in, the, in the national spotlight in a big way, right? It was, it the idea was he was coming to town for a big MAGA rally. It's gonna be this huge to do. And you're like, our taxpayers need not pay for this. Here's the bill, it's $530,000. And as long as you pay it, it's all good. And that just, Lit him on fire, right? It lit him on fire. You. He got pissed <laughs> off. His whole, you know, yeah. his supporters start attacking. You know, uh-huh. you, you know, you got to wear a bulletproof vest as mayor for a few days because of that. Because mm. you've got all these, you know, anti-Semitic, white supremacist, whatever agitators that want to come in and scare you. Um, now, but in that moment, there wasn't anything spectacular about what I did. Right. I got tons of credit, and I don't know that it was necessarily even deserved. You know. Now, similarly, there have been instances where I've been in it, which has been the exact opposite. Instances that I'm proud of, but you just get ripped apart. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, you know, you're neither as good nor are you as bad as things seem to be in that particular moment, whatever it is, that's the truth. Yeah. Then the uh, the skirmish with with Trump continued, right? You got into this thing in the midst of when the George Floyd protests were, were, were starting to peak. Um, where he went after you for being weak mm-hmm. and you defended yourself. Um, and that's where the, the classic, um, when, the shoot, when the looting starts, the shooting starts yeah, tweet so happened sick. that got flagged by Twitter. And that really set in motion his ultimate deplatforming. Like that was yeah. kind of a monumental tweet storm that went down. Yeah, I- I mean, that had to have been wild for you. And well, that was, it was wild. And I <laughs> actually didn't, I think I was informed of those tweets yeah, while I like was in, in a press conference, press conference right? uh, at the time, which was um, needless to say, one of the worst press conferences and performances that I gave largely because I was exhausted. Mm. Uh, at that point, I think we were three or four days in. Um, and no, the, you know, the things that Donald Trump spouts off needless to say are, I mean, not just irresponsible. I mean, my goodness, sometimes they were evil and thankfully he doesn't have that platform right at the moment anyway. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, what is what is the uh, a day in the life look like for you? Is every day different? Is it, is there like a walk me through like how it all works? You know, every day is different and it depends on the time. Um, I mean, when I first took office, uh, we were on the verge of having the Super Bowl. Just a, f- a month after I took mm-hmm. office, we had, you know, arguably the largest sporting event in the entire world, other than maybe the Olympics and the World Cup, right here in our city. Yeah. Um, and things looked like, you know, it was, it was constant briefings, getting prepared for safety and security measures. Um, it was, you know, welcoming people to town, welcoming Philadelphia Eagles fans as much as I didn't really care for them. Uh, it was. It was meeting celebrities at times. Uh-huh. And um, I mean, that was the, the bizarre time in and of itself. There are days where it's just policy all day long. Um, and there are also days where you're just sprinting from one event to the next that are 
diametric opposites. I mean, you're going from a, a funeral of a firefighter who has died of, of cancer. And then you're wiping away tears in your eyes and heading over to do a rah-rah event celebrating Minneapolis mm -hmm. and some extraordinary new program or business that's coming to town. And um, that's the weird part. Yeah. And that's you where at times, well, it's the trying to shift tonally. Gears because it feels fake sometimes. Yeah. You know, you're, you're in this sad state um, at one event and you're in the car um, maybe sometimes a staff, sometimes you're alone and you have to like, as Brogan says, you gotta fake it. Yeah. You know, you, you gotta like intentionally put on this smile that is. So that's what Brogan's been doing this whole time. Yeah. Been it. <laughs> Sitting over there. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta, you gotta just, you gotta force off. Oh, that force wasn't fake, it, it was force it. Force. You're right. Uh -huh. Force it is far better than fake it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I should have gone with that. But as Brogan says, you force it, and you do have to force it. Uh huh. Um, and sometimes you you start out forcing it for the first couple of minutes, and then it actually becomes genuine by minute six. Yeah. Uh, but that's kind of the reality of these days. And I mean, I uh, I try to get runs in, mm -hmm. whether they're early or late. Uh, as, as much as possible because that grounds me. My staff know when I have yeah. not gotten in my run. My, my wife certainly is aware. Uh, and you have to run every You gotta day. run, you gotta run. You, you know, gotta run. I can't I imagine run. Yeah, how you, would, how, like you're just, your ability to manage that level of stress day in, day out yeah. has improved so much from that level of self-care. Yeah. You, when you run, do you have to run with a security detail or can you just go out and run? Yeah, we had a discussion about that early mm -hmm. on and that was like definitively rejected by yeah. me. I was like, you know what, this is, no. You know, um, there are times when I wanna run with nobody. There are times when I just wanna zone out, not say, uh, not talk, and, and just kind of be in that moment with my breath. Mm -hmm. um, it's meditation in a way. Um, I'm also a very talkative and um, extroverted person. And one of the main things that I miss about my running career is not the races certainly not the hard workouts, it's the camaraderie. It's yeah. running with the guys. So, you know, I, I run routinely with, with Brogan. With Brogan uh, I mean, that, couple, that's an know. extro version explosion. Yeah, exactly. Guy. Yeah. There's well, I mean, he's more giving high fives to every other person that he yeah, sees. You, you actually can't get uh, anywhere because he has to stop on every street corner and strike yeah. up a conversation. Yeah, oh my gosh. So are um, you, you're, you're grooming Brogan to be the, the mayor who's gonna follow in your footsteps. He, oh yeah, he, he's, he's already the, the mayor of Deep Haven or wherever the hell you're living. Yeah. <laughs> Suburbia. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was going for a run with uh, uh, actually a New York Times reporter the other uh -huh. day who was in town. Yeah, John Allegan. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't met him, but it, I know he's he's here covering everything. Uh, sure. So, yeah. so I do you know the story already? No. Uh. -uh. Um, and so I had just largely ditched Brogan the night before. I was like, hey, I'm I'm good. No, I can't. I'm not going to run the next day with you. I uh, know because I was going to get a run with John. And um, I show up to pick up John. You know, outside of his hotel, and we start on the run. And within half a block, he turns to me and he says. So do you know a guy named Brogan? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. Of course. <laughs> uh, Who doesn't know Brogan? I know, of course, right. Unbelievable. And right. as it turns out, this like, you know, tall goofball dude in rollerblades had come yeah. up to him uh, maybe seven months prior. Right, uh, in pink socks and, 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 and a, green, up a green polka dot hat. Yeah, yeah, struck up a conversation. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's pretty much Brogan. Mm -hmm. Brogan, the other day we're, we're walking down the street and he strikes up a conversation with somebody. They've been talking for 10 seconds and he goes, how do you think our friendship's going? Are we getting onto the right track? Do you feel good about where this is all headed? <laughs> <laughs> you say no. That's like <laughs> yeah. right out of the broken playbook, right? Yeah. yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, man, I, I, I mean, you know, I can't imagine you being the runner that you are not making time to run, but also understanding that there are gonna be days where that's just impossible. Some, right? days, it, some days it is just impossible. Uh, and I mean, ideal world for me is I run five times a week. Mm -hmm. Maybe four to seven, eight miles per. That's kind of like the ideal sweet spot for me. I don't right. need to go more than that anymore. I don't need to crank 
any sort of crazy fast pace out, but just getting out there and breathing and the movement. Um, I mean, it is, I mean, it's heaven in so many so respects. T- tell me this and be honest with me. Yeah. What's, what's the casual pace these days? I think it probably varies somewhat. Um, well, first off, you go the pace that whoever you're running with. Mm-hmm. If somebody, right. if the person you're running with be, is eight and a half minutes, you go eight and a half yeah. minutes. You know, yeah. if if the if you, person you're running with is six and a half, you, you, you turn up the juice uh-huh. and, you, and you hit it. Um, I start pretty slow, I would say. Um, eight, eight and a half minutes a mile. Um, this is if I'm on my own. Right. And I, I usually finish the last couple miles running pretty hard. Mm-hmm. Um, Six minutes, sometimes even yeah, faster. Pretty good. Yeah. Just just for people that are listening who who maybe don't have a frame of reference, a two sixteen marathon is what's that like five twelve pace? You're good. Something around that. Yeah, yeah, somewhere around that. And this is without the fancy shoes. Oh right, the big yeah. The, and those the I mean the vapor so, flies. Yeah, and I'm all just that. telling people my PR is two oh nine because. Did you follow Jez's 50K world record the other day? I did, I did. Yeah. I, was, I didn't watch it at the time, but uh-huh. I saw that she uh, she set the world record for the 50K, was the first uh-huh. woman under three hours, I under believe. Under three hours. And then uh, five, started help, slugging help. beer out of her shoe. Right, like like really consistent 547s pretty much across the board. They just keep going, 547. Well, I mean, she's a metronome yeah. that way and she was tough. And I mean, gosh, when I was out there running with the Hansons, she was busted up, she was injured. I think she had some sort of stress fracture. Mm-hmm. She was not any sort of like, you know, I mean, she was always talented, obviously, but like she was not crushing it at the time. Right. Interesting. But she's tough. She grinds. Yeah. Um, the harder the circumstances, that's right. The, the more she's able to shine, which is why yeah. she she like that moment at the Boston Marathon was so it was so great. incredible. Yeah. I mean, in my favorite moments with Des are not running; they're it's partying. Uh-huh. I mean, I remember more moments <laughs> of partying with her and her now husband, and uh, you know, Brian Sell, who was out there at the time as well, mm-hmm. who was you know the blue collar runner, right, Olympian. Do you, himself. Are, do you know Josh Cox then too? Her you know, I've guy? met Josh yeah. Cox. I can't say I know him really well though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you, do you still follow running and I marathoning do. and all that pretty closely? Yeah, I do. Yeah. I do. Um, no, it's it's it's. Um, there, I definitely stay in touch with those that are still involved in the sport. Right. Uh, I mean, it's it's such a beautiful sport to follow. Yeah. What else? What's what else is part of your routine? Are you a meditator? You know, I'm not. Um, uh-huh. I mean, I'm I'm not a meditator in traditional form. Um, but I guess there are probably many forms of medicate. I mean, I'm not mm-hmm. on the ground, you know, with my legs crossed right. and, and no, I don't, I don't, I don't do that. Um, I've tried it. Um, my mind, my mind wanders too much. I know that, that those that are more experienced meditators would probably say that's okay. Uh-huh. Um, I would get frustrated. I, I am a, um, I use breath and mantra, which always has worked for me. Mm. You know, it's well, repetition of a phrase uh, to sort of set my mind and ground myself. Um, and I mean, my wife just calls it talking to myself, uh-huh. but that's what I'm doing. Yeah, well, I would consider that meditation. Yeah, So there you fair. go, you can say that you're a meditator. I am a meditator. Yeah. I will say that next time someone asks. <laughs> <laughs> um, where's this all going for you? I mean, do you imagine yourself, you know, being mayor here and like, what's next? Do you, do you think about the future or what's your vision for your own career and your life? I think everybody thinks about what their future is and what it holds. Um, I also think that uh, my vision for my future has probably changed dramatically in the last year and a half. Um, you know, if you had asked me two years ago, uh, I think I would have been pretty enthusiastic about a, a longer career in politics. Mm. Um, you know, if you ask me right now, I feel a deep seated responsibility and I love being mayor, notwithstanding everything else, I still do mm-hmm. love this job. Do I love it on a daily basis? No, you know, I don't. But at the end of the day, there there's this there's this feeling that you can kind of work hand in hand with community towards the betterment of people. And like, I love that. Yeah. Um, and so I, I, I love mayor, I wanna be mayor, but do I wanna do anything beyond that? Honestly, I don't know. Mm. Uh, I, if standing here today, I would, I would say absolutely not. Mm-hmm. Um, I have no interest in being in Congress for a number of reasons. One doesn't, I mean, with the exception of recently, 
traditionally they haven't gotten a lot done. Um, but also I don't want to be flying back and forth mm -hmm. for selfish reasons. I don't want to be flying back and forth between DC and Minnesota. I got a family. Um, I have, I have a, a wonderful wife, Sarah. Uh, we have a baby. I want to be with my family Yeah. Um, rather than flying back and forth without them. On the campaign piece, I mean, typically around now is where that would kind of kick into high gear, but I suspect that the pressures of the job are making that you know, not that kind of goes out the window, right? Yeah, campaigning has not, yeah. has barely happened at all um, over these last several months. And I expect the next several months to come. It's just such a lesser priority than keeping the city safe through this mm -hmm. time and making sure that people are okay. Yeah. Um, and so, no, 98% of my time is really devoted to that. Yeah. And so, yeah. Well, I feel like setting aside the kind of urgency of, of what this city is enduring at the moment, you being the accomplished elite endurance athlete that you are and the um, kind of robustness of this city with respect to its, its parks and its bikeways and everything that it has to offer in terms of outside activity and adventure puts you in this position to be kind of like the wellness mayor, like, because you live this lifestyle and you're in a city that's so conducive, you know, to these kind of participation oriented endeavors yeah. that that feels like a leadership role that suits you well. Does that resonate for you? Of course it does. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's, it's like if everything was calm the, and there was nothing going on here, maybe you could focus on that. It now is not the moment for that, but. And used to focus on that all the time. Uh -huh. um, I've got this incredible story that I, I got to tell you about um, Abdi Bile. Have you heard of this guy? Yes. So Abdi Bile, uh, Somali man, won the world championships for the 1500 meters. He mm -hmm. was the best miler in the entire world back in 89, 88, 90 in that time frame. Uh, and he went to George Mason University, which was right down the street uh -huh. from where I lived. And when I was like a 10 year old, uh, I used to take the bus over to George Mason University to try to warm up with some of these guys that were there at the time. I mean, Abdi Bile was there, Julius Achan was there a little mm -hmm. after that, but um, Abdi was like my hero. And there was this one day where I was running alone, like 10 years old, and I see this tall, dark, lanky figure running towards me. And as he gets closer, I realize, oh my God, it's like, it's the it's world the champion guy. Abdi yeah. Bile. And I thought to myself, I'll never forgive myself if I don't turn around to run with him. So I did, I turn around, I started running with him and I was so excited for this moment uh, that I probably quickened my pace a little bit and I was one stepping him. Uh -huh. And I remember he put his hand on my shoulder and he said to me, Jacob, it's not important how fast you go. It is only important that you go with purpose. And at the time I thought this was like some Somali proverb or uh -huh. famous saying that he was just repeating. But now 30 years later, having getting to know him, this is just how the guy talks. Now here's the crazy thing. So in that moment when I was running with him, I don't think I saw Abdi Bile in person for the next 25 years. Fast forward 25 years, I'm the mayor of Minneapolis. This is a couple of years ago. I get a message um, on Facebook or text or something like that. It says, this is Abdi Bile. Um, I'm coming out to Minneapolis and would love to get a chance to run with you wow. as mayor. And I was like, oh, you gotta be kidding me. This is this unbelievable mm -hmm. full circle moment. Mm -hmm. uh, and he came out, I don't think he remembered this interaction, by the way, from 25 years prior, I was just some schmuck kid. Um, but I ran with him uh, along the river. And as we were going past towards one of the most scenic areas of in our entire city, he says to me, you know, I think I could live out here. And maybe I'd like to start a youth running program to mm -hmm. help um, you know, some of these youth that might otherwise go down the wrong route. And they're like, oh my God, yes, we're gonna wow. set this up. We recruited him and got him out here. And he's now running a whole program. Oh, that's cool. For largely Somali, some not, and right. youth right. around running. Wow. Pretty cool. Yeah, that's very cool. Yeah. Um, 
I was speaking to uh, Anthony Taylor um, earlier, who's very much you know in that world yeah. of, of trying to provide access to outdoor spaces and outdoor activities to that community. Yeah, and it's super inspiring job. like that work. And there's yeah. so much work to be done there, but perhaps the most, you know, kind of gratifying thing that you could do. It's cool. It is. Yeah. 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 So do you go out and run with them now? Every now and again, yeah, we, we get in a run. <laughs> we do. Uh huh. We do. Um, he's just such a jolly, happy person. Yeah. He's learning to cross country ski now, which uh -huh. I am also. Right. Um, yeah, I did not get out once this last winter, uh, but in general, I try to get out the door. I've to, never done yeah. that, but it feels like a natural shift for anybody who's an endurance runner, right? It's You're, not. It's, it's not? It, it wasn't but for I, me. I know that it's really hard and it just kicks your ass. Well, I, I, I never got uh, my, it's a rhythm that you gotta get into uh -huh. and it's a whole, motion, especially if you're doing skate ski, which is what I think is the, that's the coolest, most beautiful motion. I mean, that's the one where you're going like this. Right. And, and um, I think for me, I'm so used to the motion of the back kick of running mm -hmm. that the skate ski motion just, it just has taken me a while to learn, not to mention I did not grow up skiing. I didn't grow up ice skating, any of that. Yeah. And so this whole concept of you are in a relatively still position while the ground is moving under you. You know what I mean? You're mm -hmm. sliding. Mm -hmm. That's not something that I've really been comfortable right. with. And so. Right. right, there's a there's a fluidity to it, but your parents were both professional dancers. So I feel like yeah. you should be able to figure this out. Figure right? it out, who knows, maybe, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I, what was that like? Two professional dancers? Yeah. I mean, that's a very interesting yeah, they, so my, my parents met in New York City. They danced for the Lubavitch Company in New York mm -hmm. City and then the Netherlands Dance Theater in Holland. And they were pretty big time. You know, my yeah. father was on the cover of like Dancers Magazine uh, and he hurt his back while he was in Belgium and a chiropractor fixed him up. And he was kind of towards the end of his dance career anyway. So he decided to become a chiropractor, move back to the States. Mm. Uh, and he continues to treat some of the dance companies anyway that come through. So he still has that connection. But my, no, my parents were very involved in the dance world growing up. You know, the basement was just a big mirror right. um, where they would use to- Why did they, why DC? Um, I think they wanted to be in the vicinity of an urban area, but not necessarily in it. Mm -hmm. uh, we grew up in Northern Virginia largely. And um, I mean, yeah, I got access to the Kennedy Center there. Um, a number of different ballets come through, um, access to culture and the arts and all the things that they really valued. Um, and, you know, most of the other, my other siblings have more of an artistic mm -hmm. uh, talent perhaps than I do. Yeah. That's wild, yeah. man. Yeah, so they, they did that. Now they're still around. They good. They're they're doing yeah. they're doing well. Yeah, they're doing well. They're still in in the Washington D.C. area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what does your what does your wife do? My wife is a my wife Sarah is a she does governmental relations. She's a lobbyist for uh, predominantly early childhood education uh, organizations. Um, she helps represent low income kids at the Capitol uh, to make sure that they're. Know, treated fairly and justly and have the right, these organizations have the right resources. Mm -hmm. She represents the ACLU, uh, a number of different organizations. Yeah, yeah. that's cool. Yeah. Um, well, I love this city. I'd yeah. like to come back in, you have to. Yeah. in the summertime. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> My yeah. blood is thin these days, um, but the trails and the outdoor spaces here are, are really something special. Oh, it's incredible. Yeah. I mean, no, there's, there's, nothing, there's nothing like Minneapolis, um, you know, I love it. I, I didn't grow up here, but it is just an extraordinary yeah. place. Maybe the, the way to kind of um, round this out and end it is just with some thoughts on, on, on what you would like people to better understand about this city because it's so much in the news and people are forming their own ideas based on you know the snippets that they're seeing. Yeah. I mean, like I said, there's, there's, there's always this duality. You know, it is a truth. Uh, that we have a long way to go with respect to racial justice and reckoning. 
Uh, it is true that we need deep change to our police department uh, and that we have these long-term and systemic inequities between whites and, and, and black community. Um, it, it's also true that we've got this beautifully diverse city um, that people really love each other here deep down. And I mean, whether it's, I mean, we're, we're known to be the, like the healthiest city in the mm -hmm. entire country, depending on which one of those ridiculous surveys that you read. Um, uh, we've got the best park system in the entire country, routinely rated number one. Um, and it's a beautiful and extraordinary place to live. Yeah. Um, and you know, all, so much of that gets missed, yeah. especially over this last year, but my goodness, it's true. Yeah. And reckoning with some really important big issues. Yeah, and, and I, my, my, what I'd like to see coming out of all of this is, you know, yes, we will always be the city where George Floyd was killed. We can also be the city where we did something about it. We can be the, this hopefully example uh, of justice and inclusion that others can follow. Um, so out of this really hard year, we hope to see a whole lot of progress. Yeah. Well, it's good talking to you, man. It's good talking thank to you, Rich. You, man. I appreciate yeah, no, it. Thank yeah, you. Best of luck. Try to get some sleep. That's right. Yeah. Try to get no, out. We'll make it happen. Get some runs. We'll make it Take happen. care of yourself. I do need the runs. I haven't gotten in one yeah. in, in a, I don't know, better part of six days or five well, days or so. Hopefully we'll make I'll, it happen. I'll come back and uh, we can lace when it are up you together leaving? tomorrow morning. Oh yeah? Yeah. There you go. Yeah. But I'll be back if Brogan has anything to say about it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Cool, man. Thank you. Appreciate Gosh, it. Gosh, thank you guys. All right, we did it. A different kind of roll on. Adam, how do different. you feel? You, you know what I love about roll on? It's plug and play. It is. And we can be free with the format. Yeah. We switched it up. We did. Do you think people liked it? Do they not like it? Leave a comment. Let us know what you think. We'll be back to listener questions. Oh, they'll next comment. Time. <laughs> yeah, they, they don't will. need your permission. <laughs> I don't have to give them permission <laughs> to comment? <laughs> <No>. Really? <laughs> they'll comment and we will read those mm, comments. Yeah. I don't know if I'm going to read them. You will. All right. We'll be back in two weeks. In the meantime, give Adam a follow at Adam Skolnick. You can follow me at Rich Roll. If you want your question answered, leave us a message, 424-235-4626. Visit the show notes on the episode page at richroll.com. We'll have links up to all the articles and all the stuff that we talked about to immerse yourself in the experience that you had today. Uh, don't forget to hit that subscribe button on YouTube, on Apple, on Spotify, all the places. We got a clips channel up on YouTube. So if you dig short chunks from the show or you wanna sample a guest before fully committing, it's a big commitment to commit to a podcast episode. We're talking about it two is. hours. Thank minimum. you for committing. So I appreciate the commitment, but if you're on the fence about that, uh, you can check the clips by just searching Rich Roll yeah. Podcast Clips on YouTube. And, uh, and then maybe see a therapist about your commitment issues. That would be advised. Yeah. I support that. <laughs> see a professional. All right, dude. Um, I love you, Adam. Oh, I love you too, and, Rich. And uh, we will talk again soon, my friend. All right. Appreciate all you guys. Love you. See you back here in a couple of days with another amazing episode. Until then, take us out. Peace. Plants. Coyote. Oh. <laughs>